Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. As opposed to our regular seasonal podcast where we break down a movie one minute at a time, this is a chance for us to bring guests into our studio and look at their lives one moment at a time. I'm your host, I'm Alan Sanders. I'm your co-host, Walt Murray. And Walt, we're going to get to a group that I have mentioned multiple times in our uh, closing segment, our entertainment segment of what I'm listening to. The group 2002, a new age group, they'll be joining us here in a few minutes. So I am beside myself ready for them to be on the stage with us. You know how many times I've brought them up. Yeah. And I've actually, uh, on your suggestion, listened to some of their music and I'm now excited about having them. (laughs) Well, good. That would have been bad if it was the alternative. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I really just fantastic music. I've kind of found myself just letting it play in the background of my office while I'm working and Mm -hmm. uh, really great. So I'm excited to have them on. All right. Well, before we get to our guests, it's been a week since you and I last had a chance to hang out. What's uh, what's been happening at the uh, Murray household? Oh, absolutely nothing. You know, we never have anything going on. <laughs> I can't believe you did that. Just I took a drink. Oh, that's why I did that. <laughs> so nothing at all, huh? Oh, no, no, nothing, nothing. You know, uh, raising three teenage girls, you never have any drama. Nothing. <laughs> What no was Father's Day, though? Boys, no. Oh, Father's Day was awesome. Yeah, Father's Day was great. And um, had a just had a blast with the girls and uh, went to my dad's house, which is always entertaining. And, you know, as you know, I've got two stepsisters who are a good bit younger than me and um, and they're twins and they each have kids. So it's um, it, it's really entertaining and loud and uh <laughs> You know, when I left there yesterday, you know, they kept apologizing. Hey, we're sorry. It's so loud. The kids are so crazy. I'm like, after raising three myself, I don't even hear it anymore. So it's just uh, kind of background noise. But uh, yeah, but that was a blast. I mean, it, and it, it was great just spending the afternoon with the kids and um, and relaxing and, you know, being excited to be a dad. So how about you? How was yours? It was good. Uh, three of the four girls were able to get back home and, and, and join us. And of course, you know, my father-in-law is visiting from upstate New York. So it was sort of a, a double whammy. He was able to get his Father's Day gifts from them and from us. At the same time, I was able to do some things as well. Uh, my girls, they know me. They, they thought it was boring. I, they don't understand. I'm, maybe I keep trying to explain. There really are differences. And as a, as a, as a male, I was happy getting the same thing I wanted last year. A good single malt scotch. They were like, well, we got that last year. I'm like, and what's wrong with that? And (laughs) it's already gone. No, no, actually, because they buy because they bought me a really nice 18 year Glen Fittich. The the joke was Sophie, our youngest, was 18 at the time. I'm like, look, you guys are both the same age. You both can vote. But one is actually a whole lot better than the other. (laughs) And depending on the day, we'll argue about which <laughs> and, one's better. And one actually makes me feel good inside all the time. The other one just mm-hmm. drives me crazy and spends my money. <laughs> so <laughs> it's awesome. No, seriously. And then uh, they did get me another one, but they, they thought I was joking. They were like, you don't want anything else? And I was like, girls, I've got a workshop. I've got my computer. I've, I'm, I'm, I do what I love. I, I don't need anything. So if you want to buy something, if you feel compelled, that's what I love. I love a, a, a nice little sniffer of scotch every now and then. And if that's what you want to get me, it's not going to go to waste ever. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And it will be greatly appreciated throughout the year. Now, the big joke I always have when, I, when I'm on the radio is another thing I think dads always want. I never understood this when my dad said it when he was still alive. But when I would ask him, what do you want? He goes, I just want you all to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he goes. That's all I want. No fighting, no arguing. Just I just want it to be quiet. Can, can we do that? I'm like, oh, that's boring. So now my daughters, when I said the same thing to them, they go, you mean like we can't start fights? We can't like get in trouble? I was like, no, just be good. You could get in your car and go somewhere that <laughs> that might help if y'all can't keep it together for a couple hours. See, we're, we're very simple creatures as far as males versus females. I mean, food 
drink quiet. Pretty simple. Yeah. Hey, very easy to please. <laughs> so uh, but you don't get like the you don't get like the traditional dad stuff like socks or a tie or anything like that. No, thank God. They didn't ever really go through that phase except for. Do you remember? I don't know if your kids did this when they were in um and probably elementary school, because I think it was done by middle school. But in elementary, they would have especially around like the holidays, they would have sort of like a uh, the chance for them to go buy things that were really kind of oh, cheap. Right. And you could send in like a $10 bill with them and then they could buy like for our school was called the hurricane. So they could buy Kane's cash and then they could kind of do their own Christmas shopping for mom and dad. And it yep. was things that were really chintzy and cheap, but they felt really cool because they were buying it. And I think that's the only time I ever got sort of those typical dad gifts. But my uh, I think growing up in a house with my wife and I involved in theater, me and radio uh, doing video production, they always knew we weren't exactly typical. And then, you know. I add on top of that, the kind of movies we love to watch and just, you know, the Harry Potter thing. We were always more about buying books or buying movies or, um, you know, as they got older, scotch. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a nice one. Well, I, I had one year where my kids bought me socks, but they bought me Bombas socks. So those are great, nice. though, aren't they? Bombas.com. Tell them the Wilder Rides here. Yes, oh, those see, are great socks. Look what happened. And, you you uh, tried to sell an ad, and your and your your audio went completely out, and so we don't get to get a credit for that uh, for uh, that paid advertising. <laughs> great. <laughs> That's bombasocks.com. <laughs> Got it in anyway. So, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> tell them the wilder ride sent you. So yeah, but uh, yeah, you're same here. I didn't have the typical you know dad gifts that go right to the bottom of the the closet or the dresser. Uh, my kids have always been more practical or uh, they bought me movies. They bought me stuff like that. So it's always been good. Well, it was a fun father's day. It was a fun for my father-in-law. Um, glad you had a good time. I know I did. I know this week, this episode will be coming out a week or so after father's day for all the dads out there. Hopefully you had a great father's day as well. And you know, and uh, you'll get a chance to uh, have had these kinds of stories to share with your friends and family uh, before we uh, bring our guests on anything else that's gone on this week. You want to bring up? Uh, no. Uh, well, I mean, we, you know, we're in that time of year where um, you want to get out on the lake a little bit and we will do that soon. But every time I've gone to put the boat in the water, it's been pouring down rain. And I just noticed we're having a huge storm here now. So uh, yeah, that's, I'm just, we, I just of, sent it over from my County. So it yeah, just, thank just you. Rolled I through. that. So. <laughs> You're welcome. So, yeah, I'll send you some more later. To... So <laughs> you know what you and I are going to do this and, and I swear we will, even if it's going to be a limited, I will bring, um, uh, a way to record something you and i will Perfect. do a sort of a mini podcast from the boat that ought to be fun <laughs> that'll be awesome yeah we'll do that in the next couple of weeks all right well let's not rock this boat any further for our guests who've been sitting in the green room agonizing wondering why in the world did we come here <laughs> <laughs> let us go straight to our audience and say please put your hands together and let's welcome to the stage not one not two but three guests from the new age group 2002 Pamela, Randy, and Sarah Copas. Welcome to the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. Hey. Thank you, guys. Hey, it's great to be here. Sarah? Oh, hello. Oh, hi. Pictures <laughs> don't talk. <laughs> Were you guys like, I'm wondering if she was shocked hearing about two dads talking about Father's Day or if it was like, like op an eye-opening experience. Well, I mean, as an only child, I'm usually pretty quiet anyway, so I think, I think they're kind of happy for the whole year, but I, I can understand if there was more of me, I think I would want to drink too. <laughs> <laughs> See, Walt and I joke all the time, we're like two players short of a softball team. He has three daughters, I have four daughters, neither one of us have sons, so it's always a lot of fun in our households. Oh, wow. wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now for me, my youngest is just now, she's got a one year of college under her belt. My other two are actually out of college. So we're on that edge of empty nesters where unless something goes drastically wrong with any of them and they decide to come back, uh, we should be done. <laughs> so let's go with you guys. I, I want to, I went to your website obviously to get a little bit of information, but I have followed you guys and known about you ever since I stumbled across. Remember back when you could go into a record store and look for records? Yeah. yeah. I was a big fan of New Age, uh, having you know been introduced to Enya at a young age, to Ray Lynch, to Yanni, a host of others that, of course, the names are all going to jump right out of my head. 
but I saw this album for 2002 River of Stars. I'm like, oh, I'll give that a try. And I have been hooked ever since. Wow. Oh, wow. That, was, that must have been, what, 2000, 2000? It was right at the turn of the millennium. I'm like, wow, these guys were really prescient. They, they named themselves into the new millennium. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the album, let's talk about your history, because you guys actually talk about having some similarities. You were both involved in theater early on. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we met in the theater department. That's, yeah, the theater department in high school. Mm-hmm. So, and, uh, yeah, I would say, Randy, we'll go to you. Tell me, uh, what was your... Was it musical theater? Were you more into performing songs, dance, or were you more into the acting or both? Well, I liked it all, but but I came in already with a lot of talent in music and and uh, and as a singer. So that made me a natural. I mean, it, it was, you know, when they did do a musical or something, I was almost guaranteed to be cast because I could actually sing uh, or, or unless they needed dancing. And then I wasn't so... You know. <laughs> I wasn't so good with yeah, that. Saying, but... You're speaking pretty highly of yourself. Okay, there, there's the negative. Yeah, no, the, well, dancing, the dancing. I'm pretty yeah. much like Tin Man, you know. Yeah. So that's where I got that need, from. In need yes. of oil. So. Okay, sorry. Good to know. I was wondering why. <laughs> why you can't dance? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've only been in one musical in my entire life, and it was enough to tell me that I am not gifted in that way. I'll stick to Shakespeare and drama. I'm not going to be singing and dancing anytime soon. Awesome. Uh, Shakespeare's <laughs> Yeah. So what about uh, what about you, Pamela? Um, how about what was your theater influence? What were your what were you gravitating toward initially? Well, he and I actually were in some of the same productions. I was a year behind him in school, though. So, you know, he hung out with the older cool kids much more than I did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, mostly musical theater, a little bit of drama. But, you know, I always loved Shakespeare and, and all that, too. So when you first started uh, in the theater, did you already have kind of a music background as well? Were you involved in band or did that slowly develop later? Oh yeah. My, let's see, my first instrument was in third grade and I chose flute and I, I'm still a flutist. So it's been my whole life. Yeah. And uh, Randy? Uh, where I got started with music mm-hmm. uh, was probably um, as a singer at a very young age. I don't even know what age, but it, it, it was, um, I had a lot of hearing problems until I was about two years old and had some surgery to remove the the problems. And I almost really kind of heard music for the first time then. So, wow, uh, it's it's been and it was like amazing to me. It was like something I, I still remember it, you know, so. And it just I've I've always done it. I've always played every instrument I could go pick up and I was allowed to play. I would play it. What was the first instrument you you uh, found yourself drawn to, Randy? Uh, Probably the guitar, uh, and, and only because my sister had one, and she was older than me, and she was cool, and you know because she was older, and then she, of course she would you know come in and find me playing her guitar and just you know get totally irate and blow up, <laughs> and uh, that made it even better. But um, yeah, I think it was guitar, and then later when I got into high school, uh, I skipped class a lot. And when I was skipping class, I was usually in the empty orchestra room or in the band room playing their grand pianos. And I, I played piano all through high school. So uh, that's that's how I got involved with pianos. All right. So uh, normally we try to go as chronologically through people's history, but we've also got your daughter who's now part of the group as yes. as a as a third member of, of the family. But she wasn't there at the beginning. But so let me ask uh, you, Sarah. Having two musically, what I would call gifted parents, uh, how did you feel uh, learning? Or did, did you just want to learn something that they were doing, or did you have a worry that you weren't going to be able to pick up on it like they did? Um, well, I kind of grew up with it, so it's kind of just like a part. It's been a part of my life for my entire life. So I kind of just mostly started with, you know, singing, and I would sing along to my favorite movies and stuff like that. And then I, um, when I was like eight or something, I think I picked up harp because you were taking harp lessons. And so I decided to pick that up and that was my first instrument. That's amazing. I tell the story a lot. I've got, I'm the oldest of four brothers, which is actually a whole different fun thing, knowing boys and no, no sisters and then being gifted with four girls. My one brother down started with violin back in his sixth or seventh grade, went from violin to viola to upright bass, learned cello on his own. Then decided he wanted to teach himself piano, then drums. And I'm like, wait a minute, you've got all of the musical ability. None of my brothers besides him, and he can play everything. I'm like, couldn't I just have one instrument, just one thing? But I can't. I've got nothing. <laughs> so I would have been terrified I didn't have any musical ability coming from two gifted parents. Well, she did, fortunately. She had a tremendous amount of talent. I mean, 
it's she blows us out of the water. I think so. Yeah, yeah I wasn't going to say that, but she now does. that you did, I'll yeah. agree. Oh wow. Um, yeah, Sarah's an amazing, amazing, gifted musician. I don't want to put her on the spot here, but uh, we... <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to put her on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> Mom got the spotlight out. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but, but uh, good. But you know, she's she's really helped us. Uh, even regardless of her age, she's helped us a lot with the productions of these records, with you know ways of going about doing things and and arrangement and just things that are way beyond her age. And so we're we don't we don't even think about it as being an age thing at this point. That's amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit then, and we'll circle back around to this because I think from you know your 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 short biography online. You guys kind of went separate directions and then came back together. So let's start off, ladies first. Pamela, when you went to college, what was sort of your course of action? Where were you going with, quote, your career? Well, let's see. I was a year behind him in school, so he was already gone when I graduated high school. And I decided to move to Ohio for some reason. And uh, I did study music there, but not officially. What I really did was join a bunch of bands. And uh, because I needed income and I played in all different kinds of, I mean, 60s bands, um, rock bands, a heavy metal band, just whatever I could do. And that's how I made it an income, you know, to get through college was just playing in bands. And I played not just flute, mostly keyboards, really. OK. And so but did you have like a, you were thinking like a business degree? You were, I mean, what was your major? I made I'm, my first major was architecture, and I got there and discovered I did not have the math skills to get very far with that. But luckily, I spoke Spanish, so I got a degree in Spanish. Oh wow, interesting! And I used it; it's been great. I mean, <laughs> we make videos for our fans. We have a lot of fans in like South America and Spain, and it's fun. Sometimes we'll make a little video for them, or you know, I always answer mm-hmm. their emails to us in Spanish, and it's, I just it's smile. Great. <laughs> I don't know. My own goes, see. See. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to her. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> okay, Randy, the same question then for you. When you, because uh, you embarked in college a year uh, beforehand, um, what was your direction? Where did you think you were going at the end of four years of, of higher ed? Oh, I did not even remotely get through four years of higher ed. I could barely get through one. <laughs> And I skipped most of those classes too, <laughs> except for the robotics class and some of the ones I really loved. But uh, you know, but I did a lot of choral stuff, and I I tremendously like focused on that in the college that I did do, the choirs, and I did madrigals. I did I, I learned how to arrange for choral music and that kind of thing. So so it was a it was kind of a good education for me. But <clears throat> but really, I got a better education moving to New York City. And uh, living in a loft with a bunch of actors and writing musicals that went nowhere, but we still had fun. And, you know, and and living there for a while, you know, a couple of years and and getting into that whole New York vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, of course, it was time to leave that. And I I left here or to come back to Texas for a job. And um, uh, and I ended up uh, when I came back to Texas, I ended up staying. Um, and lost that job, but ended up fronting a rock band for, for seven or eight years after that huh. and writing lyrics and writing music. And all of a sudden I was, you know, a front man in a, in a hard rock band. Wow. So were you two staying in touch? Did you guys have any kind of a, of a, of a little spark from high school that just disappeared or did you all kind of stay in touch or what, what, well, what was the, how, how did you diverge? <laughs> it was lucky there was no internet because I have a huge stack of handwritten paper letters with postmarks from all over the country as he would move around and he would write me these handwritten letters and I still have them. And I think that's just so cool. You know, if there had been an, the internet, I wouldn't have those and they're treasures. Mm. So were you, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I just, I don't want to pry too much, but were you sort of like, you know, childhood sweethearts through high school or were you just friends? And then when you came back and started realizing things, there was more there that, that you could explore. Well, well when did we get that? I guess, when you moved to Houston, our first date was in 1979. Right. Yes, I see your eyes got really big. Right. He's doing the math right <laughs> we now. Dated can... in... <laughs> we dated I'm not good school. at math either, so I'm like, oh. it's taking him a while. But then we went separate ways for eight years, and uh, I, here I am in Cincinnati, Ohio, with a degree in Spanish, where no one in the state of Ohio at that time spoke Spanish. 
And so I thought, you know, I should probably get back to Texas where there are people I can talk to. And uh, I moved to Houston, got a job right away. And I thought, huh, I should probably look Randy up now that I'm back in Texas. And uh, within a year, I left Houston, moved to Dallas. Right. And, and got, I was already in the band at yeah, that point. We, got and we were, we were yeah. uh, you know, at the point where we were starting to play and travel. And we'd, we'd made all of our own, you know, uh, music. We wrote mm-hmm. everything. So it was a, it was quite a project. But that's when, and then we got married. Yeah. And eventually the band, and she, and you got in a band. Oh yeah, I had that. a band. I had an industrial rock band up here. Yep. Oh really? This I yeah. love. It. I love it because when people tell me, and I because I am a metal head from the '80s, but I'm also a hard rock, but I'm also classical, and I love music scores. And when I say, "Oh, and I love new age," they're like, <laughs> "Like wow. how?" And here I am just talking to these two folks who are like part of rock bands or industrial rock, or you've done that, and and it, but you guys do now new age. So I don't think there's a whole lot of difference. It's just one's just as as amazing as the other to me. Well, New Age is all of that, you know, because we do the same thing, classical and, and you know, everything from classical to hard metal. Uh, it's all good. You know, it's all stuff that we use. And, and uh, yeah, it all it all goes into making New Age music. <laughs> I know it sounds strange, but it's true. The, the natural question is, you know, you guys got married, but uh, you were in a band, Pamela. At what point did you guys decide, rather than be apart or be on the road or be in separate bands, when did you say, let's start our own music group? 1992. That was an easy answer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And what led to that? Did y'all just say, hey, we want to do something since we're together, so let's do everything together? Or how did that come about? Both of our bands broke up near, you know, right around Mm -hmm. the same year, the same time. They one a few months after the other. So so they they broke up and and then we found ourselves without musical projects to do. So and and it was like, well, hey, we're well, we'd always been kind of just for fun playing music together i had a huge keyboard rig and he did too and we would set them up in the same room and just make all kinds of crazy music and then one day a friend of ours was doing something i'd never heard of called a guided meditation this was in the 80s and she was doing it at a bookstore and she said will you come play flute at my guided meditation i'm like what it was early 90s no because it's when uh we did uh flute for thought oh that's true that would have been the so it was the late 80s maybe around 88 89 and I'm like, you just want me to come and just like play. No sheet music, no plan. Just come play this flute while you speak over it. And she said, sure. I'm like, okay, well, that sounds interesting. So we did it. And afterwards, all the people in bookstore coming up saying, where can we get that music? And Randy and I are looking at each other going, we don't know. <laughs> but they were pulling out their wallets and pulling money out saying, where do I get that? Right. So we started to make that. So we started to make people it. People <laughs> wanted it. Yeah, when they start handing you money, you're like, I'll be right back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait Bro, right here. <laughs> record something real quick. <laughs> All right, well, actually, that, that, that begs the question. You guys were not maybe necessarily 2002, but you were in the beginnings of what would become 2002. Right. Exactly. So what were you before that? Did Nothing. You, we just made music. Did we just make music. We and the, the, Well, the first, the, the, flute out, the flute records that we ultimately made because of that, experience we mentioned those um those came out under your name yeah just cassettes and they were just cassettes we didn't make cds in those days the first the first cd we made as 2002 was wings and that was in what 1992 november of 92 and then savitry was the second one which took two or three years that that was yeah that was a long long recording but but um and we did those we, we just recorded those in our home studio and um and sold them out of the bedroom of our house it was amazing um so that's what you were doing for for income for everything or was this sort of a side gig you were still having something else at the at, at the time i was teaching spanish yeah at the I was, college i was a sound engineer i was going mm-hmm. out and doing house sound for large festivals and concerts and stuff okay so obviously t- leveraging your ear and 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 background in sound and music and and harmony and trying to make sure the speakers are working all together. There's nothing worse than going to a live venue and having something out of tune or something, you know, the mids too high or the, or the bass too, too, too low. Um, so you were, you were leveraging those skills while you were sort of building this, this, what would be your, your band. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And we were learning how to all the, the sound gigs. I, I went out and worked with huge equipment and was able to work with a lot of big acts and things. And I learned a lot about sound and that has translated into our recordings and being able to, do some of the work I was able to do there because we didn't want to be withholden to 
you know, everybody to, to go and record someplace and always have to pay someone um, to produce things. We just wanted to do it ourselves. Um, so that was a good, that was good training, actually, I think. So do you still do that or do you, have you had to uh, bring other people in to help now? Oh, for gigs? No, yeah. she, he means to. Oh, uh, no, for when you're recording in the studio, do you still do everything yourself? The three of us do everything here. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and I, I know I when you, you know, listen to the history of some bands that, you know, they go outside and bring somebody in to kind of do something fresh or to uh, help them get over a, you know, a hump or a problem they've had. Um, do y'all find that you hit those points and you're just able to work through them or do you reach out to other people to kind of say, Hey, how, how do we get by this? How do y'all handle things like that? Well, we don't, we don't do that. We, we just, I, I guess we don't have that problem. Uh, we do bring in like, for instance, this last record hummingbird that we just did, we brought in, um, for the second or third time now, we brought in string players, uh, a violinist, we know James song and, um, and and a, a violist and a cellist. And and they and, and they're playing what we wrote, but at the same time it's their their artistry that they're putting on our record. So it's not just 2002 plays every single instrument now. It's we do open ourselves up for the players, but as far as composing all the music, we do it all. Yeah, we hand them sheet music. Yeah. Which we have to do on a computer, at least I do, because I can't read a note. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it's all those classes you skipped, man. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I was playing piano instead of learning how to how to read music. Read music, yeah. yeah. And and yet you'll sit there and jam and come up with your own melodies and 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 just musical journeys. What just by jamming, just by free form yeah. playing, or just no, just composing yeah. and 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 uh, you you get themes and melodies and then usually it starts with a melody with us mm -hmm. wouldn't it yeah and, and then we just and then we compose variations of those and but it's it's usually played but um it's not ever written as notation but remember it's just it's because we had these computers and all these incredible tools if we didn't have these if it was 200 years ago and i was sitting in vienna trying to write piano music i'd have to sit down and write a bunch of notes with an ink pen you know that's mm -hmm. the only way but i would do that if that's what I had to do. Fortunately, it's, you know, 2021 and I don't have to. Do <laughs> um, before we get into some of the early, early work that, especially what I stumbled across to become a fan since I first heard River of Stars, where did you have any influences when you started hearing about people coming up to you saying, how do we get this music? It probably opened you up to realizing that there was this new category slowly developing the meditational, the spa, the new age music. So did you have any, maybe not even influences, but just people that you were like, wow, that they make really good music. We want to be like them someday. No, but what we did have, though, in the early days of, of selling what was called New Age music, we did have a lot of these little bookstores and shops that were local and, and in other places. And there were even distributors that would distribute through catalogs to these people. And they would play music like New Age music in their shop to get, and these could be people that would be selling crystals, <clears throat> excuse me, or tarot cards, or, I mean, you know, anything from that all the way to, you know, just like, just anything that it's inspired or, or whatever. But they would sell these, the music by playing it in these shops. And that's how we got started in it. We decided with Wings that we would create a record that didn't have any ups and downs as far as you know, you get five songs in and it's beautiful and you're flowing with it. And now here come the electric guitars and the hard drums, which a lot of new age music had in those days. It was all very varied on these records. So we decided to make a record that was smooth all the way from beginning to end. It, it just it took you to a place and didn't hurt you. It, it, it left you there so that you can, you know, and you felt safe. It's a place where you can feel musically and emotionally um safe and, and feel like you don't have to worry about where the music's going to take you. You can just be in it. 
Well, I was going to ask you how much you're influenced by things going on in your life and the ups and downs emotionally that we as humans go through, or do you have a, a feel for where your music is all the time? Well, the music kind of leads us. I mean, when I, when I write something, I'll sit at my harp and I'll just play. And, you know, suddenly I'll hear a melody in my head and I'll be like, Ooh, where's that? And I'll find that on the harp. And then it just kind of blossoms from there. And it's like, I'm following it. I'm not, creating it I'm following it and I'm listening to it and it just evolves itself and I think it's 2002 we've always done that we follow the music and we let it be what it wants to be and and it's great having Sarah because you know we might be talking about something she'll say hey what about this and be like huh and he might even come around and say oh that wouldn't work she'll be like try it and it's like wow that worked it always you know, does so we call <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've learned not to say that yeah, anymore. Yeah, don't do that anymore. <laughs> I've just learned when she says that, it's like, okay, try it out, even though you know it's going to work. It always <laughs> does. And but but you know it's it's uh but, but Pam's right. We don't really spend. We have our influences, you know, out in in the world and everything. But you know, musically speaking, but 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 the music just really it just sort of happens. And like she said, you go with it. You can really stand in the way of music as a composer. Um you know, or as a songwriter, you can really stand in the way of it by just trying to make it happen. T letting the idea take you rather than you trying to take the idea and do something with it, I think is, I think that's kind of how we approach it. It's more fun. Yeah, <laughs> makes better. It makes the music almost its own entity now. Now you're serving it rather, you know, and trying to make it the best that it can be rather than it serving you. All right. Well, kind of then dovetailing on what Walt asked, because some of your albums seem to have themes where you're, you're you're sort of either the Celtic dream or you're talking about enchantments or you're talking about fantasy. When you start feeling one or two songs, do you do you find yourself kind of staying in that sort of voice to know you've got an album or because because you do have it evolves with one album to the other, but yet each album seems kind of cohesive. So it, it, it seems to me anyway, from the, the layman that. There's got to be some sense of this is our tone right now. This is these are the stories we're going to tell musically. And sometimes, like early, like in Hummingbird, you want to tell about that with the, the early in Hummingbird, um, we only had a few songs, a few ideas. You know, they they weren't really fleshed out completely yet. But we, um, but we were, but but uh, the fan sent us the note. We got, we still, you know, luckily get real things in the mail from people. People write to us, and it's so cool. And this man, his name is Rick Tennant, and he uh, sent us a card in the mail, and he had written, you know, a little verse inside about hummingbirds and how they inspired him, and uh, and it, how it, we reminded him of hummingbirds. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And because, you know, hummingbirds' wings, when they move, they move in the shape of an infinity symbol, which is our logo. Mm -hmm. and so it just kind of was like me following this little breadcrumb trail uh, of the and um, then we found out the bird was indigenous to just our part of the world, and all these wonderful stories about it, and it was all about hope and joy and healing and balance and harmony, just everything everybody needed in the heart of a pandemic. And so we followed that. That you're right. We followed the music where it was taking us. That's that's amazing. Now there is something that I think you guys do very very well. And uh, once again, you're talking to somebody who has. No ability to understand music theory. I don't know how to read music, but I have a love of the listening of the music. I love how some of the elements of what makes you 2002 is there's always that sense of the reverb, the echo, and yet you've got an instrument. I feel like, let's say the guitar, when you're playing the acoustic, the strums are up to my ear, and yet I can hear it echo in the room. And there's just something that just transports me, like I'm floating, or, or I'm flying, or I'm just being taken to a different place. And you do that so well as sort of your signature sound. Was that yeah. something you guys just developed over time? or Because it feels like it's there on a lot of your music. It is. And, and it's our instrument set as well. You know, the, the palette of instruments that we use. We have the same 20 or 30 instruments that we, we don't always use them for every record. But some of the instruments we've used, we, we still use that. We use them on wings. Um, some of the synthesizer sounds especially. I 
I guess that signature sound is just, it's our palette. It's what we, when we think of 2002, we, we are usually drawing from that palette, but that palette is always expanding. So, um, and as far as the sounds and things that you're hearing, that's just, that's just us messing with time, you know, in space. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> and I know there's, there's, uh, and again, the computer helps with this. There's a lot of layering. There's a lot of that echo effect on the voices too that just give it that sense of angelic kind of voices as if you hear multiple people, but yet, you know, it's the same voice singing and it just has that inspirational sort of quality to it. Yeah, we have a, the, the way we do that with our, our voices is we sing a whole lot of them and we, we put all the tracks together. So it is like a whole lot of us singing. Um, you might have eight or ten tracks of him stacked on top of eight or ten tracks of me, and then, you know, <laughs> we're lucky ten or twelve tracks of her. It takes a lot. It takes a long time, but then you have a, a chorus of, mm -hmm. you know, 30 or 40 people, but it's really just three people singing different parts. Mm. Wow. I don't want Sarah getting too bored here, because one of the things I've noticed is, starting with the band initially very young, you've got also a very, uh, I guess, a sopranic voice, very high. Um, you've been able to spotlight yourself in a lot of the later songs as you've grown into the band. How has that felt, sort of being able to sing so many of the songs as sort of the lead vocal almost? Um, well, I think it's just, it's not like some people, I don't know if they really think it's enough. Sometimes you're, you say that like, some people may think that I'm like forced into this or something like that, mm. or that, you know, I feel obliged to, but it's not really about that. For me, I just, I enjoy putting in my creativity into this work and, you know, giving my own, um, like, take on some of this stuff and giving ideas. And if I can help out in any, any way I can, I really like to do that. I really like to um, add what I can to it without, you know, being invasive on it because I'm not really, I mean, I'm not one of the base members. So I kind of like to put what I can into it. I think it's a lot of great experience. And I think I learn a lot every single time I come in here and do something. And if I didn't mean my question to make it sound like somebody was, you know, putting your arm behind your back and going, you get out there to the microphone. But, <laughs> but more or less, I've noticed your quality of voice works so well at the level it's at. You tend to have a lot of the, at least the songs that I will come through my, my speaker at home. And I say, play the music of 2002 and it just will loop for like the next eight hours. I'll just let it keep playing. Your your voice tends to I hear as sort of a lead now in some of the the later works of 2002. Yeah, um, I feel like that my voice is very different from both of your voices, and I mm -hmm. feel like that um, it kind of can expand your creative palette. And that if you write a part and you think that it would you know be best expressed with my voice, I'm really glad that I can be there to help with that, help express that, and bring something to its fuller potential. Yeah. Well, and what's lucky for us, when she was, I think, nine, the music school she was going to started a Gaelic chorus. And so she learned how to sing in Irish and, and Scottish Gaelic and mm -hmm. uh, Gaelic, sorry, and uh, Welsh. And she learned how to sing in all these different languages. And we were like, ooh, this could be fun. You know, we can add some of that into the 2002 palette when she gets older. And I guess you were probably, what, about 15 when you did Celtic Fairy Lullaby for us. And those were songs that she had learned working with a, the director of the Gaelic Chorus. And then we took her singing in these languages and we added the 2002 kind of blanket around it. It was just, it was just fun. It was a fun project. An interesting thing about, that I want to add about that, about that story is that when she first did that record, she was nine, right? Which, she, Celtic Fairy Lullaby? No, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Celtic. No, she was no, eleven she when she was did. She much older than yeah, that. Yeah, I can't remember. But, but it came out in two thousand six. A while ago. Yes, yes but, oh, but, no. but Celtic very <laughs> low. <laughs> math. We'll just blame it on math. Whatever. <laughs> that, that album started out as being, you know, a, so, a basically a solo record we were going to do for her or with her, and and um, she came in and 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 sang a lot of those songs. She came in and sang no accompaniment. No starting notes. She has perfect pitch. She doesn't even need it. She would come in and just sing the song and acapella. just lay it down a cappella onto a track. And then we would come back and we started orchestrating everything around it. And pretty soon it's the orchestrations and everything started to sound very 2002 like. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, 
So we're going to do this. We're just going to make this a 2002 record. That's that's kind of how that one got got started. But it was it was really just orchestrating around her voice all by itself. Well, that, I was going to bring up actually Celtic Fairy Lullaby because I think the one that I hear so often that comes in the loop of when I say play the best of is the the Hushaby Hush or, or was it the Garten Mother's Lullaby? I don't know how to yeah. say the uh, the the Gaelic title, but it's incredible and it has a very for me anyway, a very Enya-like feel because her voice hits that same registry for me in my ear as as Enya's voice, who is a person I have every one of her records, every one of her albums because I just I'm a fan. She's really good. Yeah. So so Sarah, since you're kind of in the school mode, has has there been thoughts on your end about going and maybe taking advanced music theory or anything vocal? practice or things to kind of take a natural gift and go further with it um i think i might i'm really not entirely sure what i'm going to do i mean i should probably make more fine like final decisions because i'm going into my senior year of high school coming up so i should probably know what i'm gonna do exactly but <laughs> nobody I'm, does <laughs> i was gonna say um <laughs> a lot of people don't know when they first go into college or anything like that. but the so, difference uh, is you're already kind of in your career or at least a calling so that may help a little bit yeah, and um, I feel like that with maybe with college, I think at least for now, I'm probably going to go to um, a community college and just study a lot of my interests and kind of feel out where I want to take my education. But in terms of music, I was kind of very fortunately born into this place where I have all of these tools and a very supportive family who can help me um, with my own music career. And so I feel like that if I want to take my music in a more like, theory direction where I want to learn more about that I might study some of that in college but I think that I already have the tools to uh I just got to get to it and right. work on it in my own home mom and dad that's got to make you feel pretty proud yeah it does it much. does we're we're very happy that she likes it here you know it's mm-hmm. it's hard not to like it here if you're a musician because yeah, we have out. like <laughs> <laughs> I think you're all right for now <laughs> No, but we're but we're really happy that she feels that way, and and um, it's just I can't tell you, you gentlemen, what a joy it is to to have a family that's here making music and making records together in our little world class studio here in our, you know, at our house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's and what I said at the beginning um, when we started this endeavor, um, I, I think I may have said it actually to you guys before we started recording, but Walt and I, the, how we pick our guests is more to do with have we found people who have a passion for something that just love what they do and then they want to share it because it makes it a very easy interview. I don't have to do a whole lot. Just say, how did you do it? And it seems like you guys have been lucky enough to have discovered your passions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. There's Mm -hmm. I can't, can't even imagine doing anything else. Remember, I mean, I'm a guy and I live with these two ladies and they both play harps. Do you know how cool that is to walk into a house at night and there's harps going? It could be bagpipes, you know? Right. It could have been accordion. I mean, it could be anything, but yeah, trumpet. <laughs> accordion. <laughs> Drums. No. <laughs> Let me ask about the, the some of the layering, because when you, do you guys do live concerts? Because I've seen videos where you've had to bring in musicians to play some of the instruments because they you don't have the luxury of layering all of them and then playing it as a recording. So when yeah. you guys do play, do you bring in musicians to fill out those other parts? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, we don't perform very often for that reason. It'd be really, really tough. I mean, when we have a recording and there's 40 Pam, Randy, and Sarah singing, we don't know how to pull that off live. Oh, you know? I didn't so know if there would be a way to, to kind of, I guess, encode it in your synthesizer so you could kind of recreate that sense live. Well, we yeah, do. We when, when we play that way, that's what we have to do. And we have ear sets where everything is timed and we can hear where we are in the song. The, the idea there is that we get as many musicians as we can. Obviously, we can't get 50 singers to come in. We could never afford to pay them. But, but we tr- get as many musicians as we can when we're going to perform. And we pull off as much of the important parts live as we can. Real playing of the lead instruments, real singing of the lead vocals. Um, you know, and and try to try to push the, the, the less important stuff to the tracks, you know, the, the, the accompanying tracks. And just with a modern production with as thick as the productions that we have and as layered as they are, that there's no other real way to do it. It, it is for the folks who folk, if you're brand new to New Age and I would highly suggest sampling a bunch of it because I know a lot of our listeners 
are all over the place. If you have never given any of these bands, including 2002, a try, you need to just kick back, relax, dim the lights, put the candles on. We maybe wait till the winter if you want. Put the fireplace on. It's some of the best music to have in your life, especially if you feel stressed, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like the world is caving in on you. It can be sort of like what, what for me, what movies do is it takes me away for a little bit and kind of helps recenter myself so I can re, you know, attack the problem the next day. Because the problem's still going to be there. I might as well just give myself a little break. Yeah. Right. That's good. And music's good for that. You know, it's mm-hmm. a it's a vacation and it's it's not harmful and it's addictive, but in a good way. <laughs> well, I know we've been t- talking for a little bit. We've still got some time with you guys. I know you guys have been working last year, obviously, not a whole lot else to do besides sit in the studio. You've been working on a brand new album that, as we're recording this, is pretty much ready to release, right? Oh, it's out. Yeah, we've released the digital uh, the version digital of it. digital came out June 11th, and the physical copies will be available July 16th. So tell us a little bit about your latest album. This is your chance to, to sell the album. <laughs> <laughs> well, we told you about the Hummingbird inspiration from our, our fan. That's why we named the new album Hummingbird. And the songs are all kind of in that theme of harmony and joy and healing. And um, tell your experience during the pandemic. Yeah, that was, it's, it's, I guess it is our pandemic record. But, it is. But I like to think of it more as 2002's Pastoral. It's more of our celebration of nature. Um, and, and it was. It was during the pandemic. I was driving toward town to go do something. And it was right in the middle when everything had been locked down for a week or two, uh, the whole country at that, at that time. And, and I'm driving down and I'm, I'm looking at, and I'm just r- driving down the street and I look down, I'm going 75 miles an hour down this boulevard. And I'm like, Oh, why am I going this fast? It's like, I can't even figure out. And it was because, and as I'm slowing down, I realize it's because there's nobody here. This is like, I feel like Will Smith in that movie where everybody died, you know? It was, yeah, I Am Legend. Like, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. Legend, you know, where it was just him. I, it was like there was nobody. There weren't even any cops to give me a ticket. I mean, there was nothing. And and I thought this entire world is just turned upside down completely. But then when I got back home and I walked out to my garden, it was a really nice day. We have a little garden in our backyard. And I walked out there and I noticed that all the little creatures were always doing what they always do. They were still out there being, nature was still exactly perfect, pristine, doing everything it always does. It was only humanity that was turned upside down. And I thought, I thought for nature to be able to heal itself the way it does, you know, uh, we're part of nature. Why can't we heal ourselves that same way? Why can't we use that same sort of get, get, touch nature a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. and get some of that vibe. And um, I think that's what this this record is about. You know, it's just it's the resiliency of nature to heal herself and that we can be part of that healing. I had a chance to before we even uh, started recording this, I went to go to your channel, your YouTube channel, which I want to make sure you guys get a chance to plug all the ways folks who are listening can find you, listen to you. Uh, One of the songs I listened to was uh, Gathering the Clouds from that new album. And I was immediately just. I almost wanted to say, can we can we put the interview back for about an hour? I need to finish listening to all these songs. I mean, that's how compelling it was on a first listen. That's uh, yeah, that's song number three mm-hmm. on the record, and yeah. and uh, they they get more. It, it gets. I noticed the record gets more natural. There's more natural elements to the music as it goes deeper and deeper into the record. I, we didn't design it that way. It just turned out that way. But that was actually named after one of the the indigenous legends that I was talking about. the The world had been basically set on fire, and the hummingbird flew up. And he pulled the winds from the four directions and clouds and made it rain. He gathered up all the clouds from the four directions and made it rain and put out the fire and healed the earth. And he was gathering the clouds. And we thought, that's just perfect, you know, for this this song. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's right. 
healing yeah. year. So when you're working on a song and you kind of go through that first brush with it, do you find yourself, you know, continuing to tinker with it until you feel like you've really got it down? Or do you find a lot of times that first initial run through with it ends up being where that song goes? Uh, if that question even makes sense, how much do you see those songs evolving as you're working on them? That's a good question. Um, it's, I think it's kind of a it's kind of a balance of everything you just said. It's it's not really one way or the other. The the songs usually start with a main melody. And that, and that be like if it were in a regular songwriting scheme, that would be the chorus. You know, that's the thing, that's the hook. That's the thing that we that's the main theme that we got caught on to. Then sometimes it's about writing other parts. But a lot of times if you just start to flesh out the one theme, even just a little bit, the next part comes automatically. And then the next part comes after that, and then you start figuring out ways because of wh- how you've gone so far that you can arrange them to to be more interesting. And it's just it, that's the process. It's um, it's not very glamorous, really. It's just kind <laughs> of we kind of get the information and we and we put it down and make it reality. Yeah, or sometimes it's the perfect take. Oh no, I didn't push the record button. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. You know, or I had the wrong mic set up. Can you play it again? Yeah. yeah. Right. And there are some times when it can't be played again because uh-huh. that performance is never going to be that good again, possibly. Mm. So we can't risk it. So it's like, okay, well, let's see how many plugins we can put on that to make it sound right. <laughs> sometimes you have to. But uh, you just, sometimes it's a matter of problem solving. Yeah. But that's what tools come in really handy for us. Well, Walt's question actually made me think of something about how a, new age music is crafted differently than your typical rock album or your typical pop rock where you've got well time for the guitar solo here and then here's where we come back to the main chorus and here's where we wrap up and end for radio play when you try to keep that smooth in out kind of waves how do you know when the song's done hmm. oh i guess when it's five or six minutes long and you're, <laughs> and you're looking at you're looking at one more minute and it's just going to be like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so pretty much I, the same. Like, that's, it's like, okay, end it before that is usually my. <laughs> well, and my. part of it is because some of your music is, is highly instrumental where there may be the, the angelic voices as almost its own instrument. And then some of your songs obviously have lyrics and have a start, middle and end. But I was just curious in terms of the construction, maybe more of the instrumental because they they do have seem to have a feel to them, but there's no guitar solo. Like here's where the guitar solo goes. It's just because it's right. all music and it starts and goes, and it's just it's hard to explain if you've never listened to New Age. But it's to me, it's it's amazing. It's it's more classical than it is standard folk music. The 2002 is based on standard folk music. If you look at the chords we play, and it's pretty much you know in that in that style, soft folk music, but but there's a lot of classical influence, and particularly, at least from my point of view, there's a lot of Romantic era um, classical music involved. Well, I love when you mentioned a pastoral because I, I we had a, a music uh, composer on with us a few weeks back, and I was telling him how Beethoven is one of my all-time favorite composers, and the pastoral is just an amazing symphony. I told my daughters the very first time I played it, I said, "Close your eyes and tell me where are you? Where do you imagine?" And they literally said, "It feels like we're outside in a field." In the country, Aww. yeah, in the country. So that what what does he name that first movement? He named it uh, "Feelings of Being in a Beautiful Countryside" or something like that. It, what he called the song? It's amazing. And I said I argued if Beethoven was alive today, he'd probably be our John Williams. He'd be a film composer because how he can just evoke what's happening on screen. He can make the music, make it happen in your head. Yeah, he's for for me. He's arguably the the greatest composer that ever lived. Even to this day. Here, here. <laughs> so for those folks listening, you do approach it sort of that way in terms of, a, of a, a classical piece of music in the sense of it doesn't have necessarily a lot of solos, but you may have vocal solos or vocal places where an instrument gets a little bit more focus, but it's not your typical rock or pop kind of f- structure. Most of it's not, yeah. Like There's no formula. Like it's less formulaic, but it has a storyline and a purpose. Right. With different sections. That's a right. good way of putting it. 
Look at and that. We should have just asked her the question. I know, right? <laughs> Answered it one <laughs> sentence, and then here we are. Go on about it. Would have been a dramatically short podcast, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, talk, um, talking more, a little bit a bit more about Hummingbird, um, uh, because that is the latest album that is out now digitally and will be out physically. Uh, by, by the time this comes out, it'll be about a month, a little less than a month away. Uh, how much effort went into this versus maybe some of your other ones because of the pandemic, because there was that year plus of shutdown. It was tremendous. We had a lot of uh, hiccups and including when, remember when the console went down, unfortunately the people, the only people that could help us were in California and California was closed. Yeah. So we went for what, a couple of weeks where we couldn't hardly get anything done. Right. We don't mix anything. We don't mix our records in a mixing, in a, in a, standard compute just in a computer we mix them on an actual console and it's a really like a, a really high-end one and it makes a certain sound that we can't do any other way so when the console went down we were we were stuck for three or four weeks right at the beginning stage of mixing the record and mm. because it was a spring summer type record we were very concerned that we were not going to be able to get it out it is not an album the sound of it is not the album that you release in the fall it's just not one of those records you know and so and the label agreed with us fortunately and and they said yes let's we'll put it out as pronto as fast as we can uh but there were tremendous things and then of course we had the great texas ice storm that happened right oh along the right thing. and um and so our electricity was rolling on and off and on and off we couldn't even have the studio on during that it was it was a, a time where we just we had to throw up our hands and just say wait and wait until all of this is over. Well, and then we couldn't get the string players out. Then we couldn't get the string players to come out mm-hmm. because it, it was either pandemic and you know, or or, or it was uh, because they they had a like a well a relapse or what, what would you call it when our state shut down? Then it came back up, but then they had to shut it down again. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it kind of had a spike. And... So right when we were getting our string players to come back, then they couldn't come because they're a um, they they actually play as part of a quintet. And they they can't take any risks on you know anyone right. getting sick or anything in the studio. So, so with those challenges, that also did give you time. Did you find yourself maybe, as Walt asked you earlier, did you massage some of those tracks more? Did you have time to kind of maybe work through some things differently than you had in previous records because you had extra time? No, no. When it was when it came time to mix it, it was absolutely ready. Oh. Well, there was one bass line that I was not happy with, and I came back in and replayed part of it, but that's all. What about, though, uh, in the writing of the songs themselves, or were they all pretty much ready to go when pandemic hit? Oh, no, not when the pandemic hit. Um, yeah, because because we started the record in last spring, at some point in last spring, about the time we got the, 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 the letter and all that, but it was... It was really during the fall that we that we really started pushing forward with it, and I think it was probably February or March when we were when we were pretty much done with it and ready to mix it. Mixing should take about two or three weeks, but it took us two or three months because of all those things that stood in the way. Gotcha. So that album is ready to go a year later than maybe expected, but you mm-hmm. wanted it out for the spring slash summer, which is where we are right now. Where it is, and yeah. it's and it's uh, uh, people are liking it, you know, as so far, far as we know. Yeah. yeah, I actually want to read a quote that Pamela sent to me, and uh, so that way uh, I think this says a lot about what you've got going uh, for your for the album. And it's a quote from Steve Shepard that said, "Quote: It is hard to explain this, but whilst writing this review, I haven't spoken, drank, or moved, and barely even breathed, and only just realized I hadn't even saved my work." This is how amazingly great this album is. I kid you not, this is without a doubt the best instrumental album that 2002 have ever created. Hummingbird will probably go down in musical history as one of the best examples of 21st century New Age music there is, as it really doesn't get any better than this. Wow. Can you do it in a British accent? Yeah, that's my Steve. (laughs) He can. Yes, I can. (laughs) Don't encourage me. Thanks, Pamela. <laughs> oh. I'm just making sure. No, now, on top of having what is probably the single best run-on sentence to make me want to stop and buy this album, yeah. there's also a little bit of a of a challenge in there. 
He, he's saying you're never going to do better than this. I know. You just wait. <laughs> I know. And that's that's always the fear is that you're not yeah. going to be able to. You're going to put yeah. out something that's really good. And that what do you do after that? You know, where do you go? But somehow it just you do. It'll be all right. Well, I, I was going to ask, is there other type, you know, do, do you have other styles of music you've thought, you know, let's diverge a little bit and just do an album in whatever? Or uh, Pamela, have you said, you know, I, those industrial rock days really are calling back to me. Let me, you know, put the band back together. Have y'all had any of those moments? Well, Sarah huh? composes. Well, no, definitely Screamo. Screamo. Screamo, yeah. 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 Screamo for this record. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we should do the exact opposite. <laughs> oh, well, actually, Sarah's working on her own album, and it's not New Age at all. No. And uh, it, we're hoping that she'll let us uh, help her with that help this her year. Help produce it. Which will be, <laughs> what genre would you say it is? I'd say it's more pop, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't really define it in one genre, you know, but I mean, I would show you parts of it, but I'm I'm one of those people that's like, no, it's not good enough, just over and over again. It's like, no, it's not, I'm not, it's not good enough to show yet. I've got to keep working. <laughs> and know. it just keeps going. So eventually I'll have to put my foot down and go, no, I need to actually show this now. Mostly piano. Right? I hate to sound like an no. old dad from some place, but I, but I was exactly the same way when I was her age. I, I was not ready to show anything I was creating to anyone. I was w way worse than her. I think don't all artists at some level, unless you're just an egomaniac, suffer from that because you don't want to risk that somebody comes along and says, you suck, and then you never want to do it again. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because that, that, that one, you suck, is going to be the last thing you do in music. You know, it'll hit you at the wrong time. It takes a little bit of age and wisdom to start realizing, OK, there are going to be people who will never like what I do, but that's OK, too. Right. Exactly. Well, and it's, it's always interesting to me with artists when I hear their stories and so many, and you know, there's so many movies and things like that in pop culture where it's like, uh, Jaws shark movie. We're going to pass. Uh, you know, what's the star Wars thing? No, no, thanks. And you just know that there are going to be people who don't get it. So even if you hear no, even if you hear no a few times and you know, it's good, stay with it because you know, a lot of times those are the ones that become the biggest phenomenons and that really hit people in, in a unique way. So um, if you know, it's good, stay with it yeah. until you're ready. That's oh, I, I, I yeah. would, I would agree with you completely. It's, it's, you've got to stick to your art. And if you, if you believe in it, you know, if you believe in what you've done and all the work that you've put into it, how can you not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, because making stuff, stuff that's good. I know that anyone can make a record in their bedroom now. You know, but making one that's a good record in your bedroom is a lot harder to do. I mean, you know, Billie Eilish notwithstanding, mm. it's a hard thing to actually, you know, to, to, to come up with something that's actually good in that respect. And so <laughs> if you can, I think that you should pursue it. And and if you have, I think you have to stand behind your art with everything you've got and don't let anyone tell you that it's not. If you're if you go to someone and they tell you ah, your record stinks. OK. It stinks to you. I don't care about you anymore because you don't listen to what I do. You go find someone who does like it. And I don't care how what it is. Somebody out there likes it. Well, how many publishers you know? turned down Harry Potter? Exactly. <laughs> right. Dozens, dozens yeah. of publishers. Now, what do they think now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is hard when you get those rejection letters. You're like, oh, what mm -hmm. did I do wrong? Uh, yeah, but, Albert Einstein. I don't think your son's capable of getting a good education, and I don't. <laughs> you know, that was the letter he got. Yeah, I think every artist, just about. I mean, because you, you, there's always those exceptions as well. If you were from a, a, a famous son of, or daughter of a famous actor, sometimes you get an extra leg up. But I think everybody who kind of had to battle through their art at whatever level all have very similar stories of being rejected, being told that no one's going to get it, or this isn't. No one will like what you're doing, or this is too weird, or this doesn't make any sense. Why don't you follow the formula? And you're like, well, I don't want to follow the formula. And they end up finding that niche because it is unique. It is different. And they end up becoming the trendsetter. Right. And yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, and I think that, you know, you've got to believe in it that much. You've just got to believe in it. You've got to believe in it to the point where whatever they tell you is not going to affect what you're doing. You've got this path that you're on and you have to stay on it. As we're starting to wind down and my buddy, I think, has gotten his computer locked up. Either that or he's taking a real long drink here. Um, 
He's not moving. He's not moving. <laughs> no, oh, he just oh. went away. <laughs> um, so for folks, I'm going to ask you just a couple of series, maybe rapid fire style questions. Do you have a favorite album or does it just change based on your mood? Do you, do when you look at your catalog of your, all the work you've done from holiday theme to Celtic theme to more, maybe more folk versus more maybe uh, ethereal. Do you have a favorite? That's like comparing your children and saying, which kid do you like best? Very good answer. See, that's the mom. Oh, some days I can tell you. <laughs> our babies. What are you doing, Alan? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd have to I'd have to split it into two for me. Really? I would have to split it into vocal, predominantly vocal record versus mm-hmm. non-predominantly. My predominantly vocal record, my very favorite one would be A World Away, which mm-hmm. was two albums ago. Um, as That's far as the the instrumental record, I've got to say at this point, it's going to be Hummingbird. Okay, so you're the dad that picks favorite. Yeah. Good. <laughs> but I'm an only child. Okay. No, I picked, a, I picked a favorite boy and a favorite girl. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, my girl's always there. They're like, who's our favorite? I'm like, well, it just depends on who screwed up today. Right. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it always changes. So. No, I'm just curious which ones that you might find yourself. Not, I, I know what you said, Pamela. You're right. It was an unfair to say what's your favorite as if the other ones suck. But I just meant in terms of, do you find yourself maybe gravitating toward one sometimes when you just kind of want to re-inspire yourself or you just find yourself, that's a good one to just kind of put on and get back into my thinking about the next album? Hummingbird. Hummingbird? I can't wait to get it. I, can't, we're, I cannot I, wait. We sent it to you. I'm so sorry. No, they should have sent it. I'm no, so sorry. You're a very big, influential yeah. person in the media. We're going to get it to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am. Man, they're really pumping your head today, aren't they? <laughs> so let's yeah. let like, some of the other rapid fire ones that I wanted to get to. In terms of uh, your your social media, you guys have been involved with your website early on because I remember seeing, uh, even writing to you many, many years ago and getting a response. I was like, wow, the actual band was responding. How have you felt? as being sort of independent or kind of these kind, you know, cause you're not like the, the Iron Maiden, you're not selling out, you know, like stadiums, you're doing a different kind of music. How do you like engaging with your fans and do you do all of your social media yourself? Well, we do, we do it all ourselves. Um, back when we started, there was no internet or social media or anything like that. And then when we suddenly had those tools, I mean, I had to write code. I had to learn HTML. I had to type actual code to create a web page. And so I think being on the ground floor of all that happening and then, you know, and and then the social media evolved throughout that. And it's like, oh, now we have, um, gosh, what was the first one? Space. uh, MySpace. 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 Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, And so really, it's just from the beginning, we've kind of been involved as those technologies came along and those things, you know. And, of course, now they're passing us up because the kids are all doing the things I've never heard of. So oh, like TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> so but then we also have YouTube mm-hmm. um, that we've been building yeah. and growing with our video. We've we've always done videos since what 2001. Oh, yeah, we we started with a little Panasonic camera that we couldn't even afford that we got, you know, movie camera. And, and but just just started working on videos for a long long time and I think that the YouTube part of our social media has really grown, mm-hmm. especially with the work that she's with that that Pamela is doing here. Mm-hmm. Um, Lately, some of the video work she's doing is just outstanding. Thank you. you Do you know? find it becoming a, almost a side full-time job trying to stay on top of YouTube comments and Facebook comments and Twitter comments or wherever else you happen to be? It's hard, and I drop the ball a lot. But, you know, when someone writes writes to us personally, we always try to answer, even if it's just a short answer. And I don't yeah. want anyone to feel like we're blowing them off. So, uh, you know... It's hard, yeah, but it's important. You know, I don't want anyone to feel like they're not important. We we try to be accessible, you know, as much as we can. Mm-hmm. All right, so where where can people follow you, find you, like you? We all like you, but I mean, where do they like you, like you? <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. Well, you can find all the links on our website, which is 2002music.com. And then when you get there, you can find all the links to YouTube, Spotify, Pandora, you know, Facebook. Um, I'm kind of failing at the Instagram thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so really uh, anywhere. You can find us anywhere. Um, Amazon Music is a good one for us. Apple, iTunes. Yeah, well, as a matter yeah. of fact, the, the physical product for people that like CDs, they can pre-order it at Amazon right now. Yeah. 
And it's like you said, it's out in what two or three weeks, three or four uh, July weeks. July sixteenth. Yeah, they'll so, have the physical. So three time. weeks or so, and it'll be out and and um and and yeah, you can pre-order those there. When I stream like you guys from my Amazon Echo, and I just say, "Hey uh, Alexa, play everything by 2002." Does that royalty eventually get back to you? Absolutely, sure it does. You betcha. Good. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Do more of that. <laughs> well, I have recommended, and Walt, you know this. We always have our segment toward the end of the show that you and I do, where we're looking at what we're reading, watching, and listening. To I, I I have put on there multiple times. I'm like, you can stream the music if you're playing if you've got a service. Um, it's awesome. It is just incredible to let it play. Sometimes I hate it because it's all over the place, so I don't know what album it's coming from, and now I got to go try to figure out well, what's the name of that song and where did that out al- what album was that. And, right. But at the same time, um, I was hoping that would happen for you guys because there's times where I'll fall asleep and it's playing all night long, and I wake up to it, which is like actually an incredible waiting to wake up to. That's amazing. That's cool. <laughs> And and Walt has even been pulled into listening. He's been. I have a I have a very weird, very eclectic taste in music, but I it's kind of like that old thing of I don't always know what I'm listening to, but I know when I like it, and I, I really do enjoy your music. I've got a, uh, a a very weird job, and I've got ADD, so I kind of like having your music in the background just as a, a soothing voice there. Well, what so, do you normally listen to, Walt? I mean, as as- uh, you know, I listen to everything from kind of uh, classic rock, a lot of classic rock, a uh, lot of classic country. Um, but then I've got like Best of Inya on my um, on my list. Um, my nephew is uh, is in a band called Old Sea Brigade, which is I don't know exactly how to classify him, but I same, kind of same thing. I just like the more easy um smooth music that he has uh so I, i'm all over the place i'll even listen to some classical music sometimes um i, I listen to a lot of grateful dead um uh it, so I, i'm kind of all over the place that's that is eclectic mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I, i've got a friend who is a, a music professor at yale and over the years he's really kind of pushed my taste and um so it, particularly when it comes to classical music i every once in a while I'll send him a note and just go hey i was listening to this what is this he's like yeah that was like 1742 it's been around so, <laughs> this is not new <laughs> well for people that were like walt who are just maybe stumbling on on your band for the first time people that are listening to our podcast and they're like you know these guys seem really really cool i want to check them out what's a good intro album what's the good album to say here's something to really get a sense of who 2002 is it's got to be hummingbird. If if it's instrumental again that we're talking about over like more vocal material, it's got to be hummingbird because it, it really is. And I I know everyone says this about their newest work, but in this case, it actually is true. It is a culmination of everything that we do, all the good aspects of what we do to make records is in this one, and um, and and I'm we're just really proud of it. You know, it's a it's we became more of ourselves with this with this one wow i definitely love the instrumental although i'm assuming when you say instrumental voices as sort of voices are still there like oh, river of stars yeah. yeah yeah we've got lots of you know choruses and things we just don't have lead vocals with lyrics right uh, for, and that's that's the way i i call and it's what i call we do even though vocals are all over it for the us that's an instrumental record and it and it's because you know we decided to do that early on because you have there's a certain kind of freedom that you have as composers when you're not writing lyrics. And uh, we're fortunate that we're in a genre of music that we can do either or. We can do a mostly instrumental or all instrumental record, or we can do a vocal record, and it's still considered as part of our genre. It's awesome. Because um, I, w- I always suggest, but now once I get Hummingbird, I've always said, well, the, the one that hooked me was the first one I got, which was River of Stars. And I still go back to that one because I just think it's an amazing oral journey. It just takes me in all the best places I want to go in my head. That's that, that was when we first started using the heart in, yeah. in our music and we were, um, yeah, it's a, that, that is an amazing record. It's very bright. You know, every single song on that record is in a major key. There's not, a, there's no minor keys <laughs> in any of that record. The whole thing is in major key. 
Well, and I kind of find it's hard to make sad music on the harp. <laughs> and so yeah. when the harp is in the music, it's like it it really does kind of energize you. You know, you you can't be sad listening to the harp. <laughs> no, Ed, that's true. And and um that's a that's one of the things that that make it magical. Even if we have songs that the harp is not playing a big giant role, we'll still have it in there, you know, as a texture. It's just that sound. It just does something, you know, to to the listener. I don't know what it is, but we use it. Well, I think music in general touches a part of us that nothing else really can. Mm-hmm. And it it hits emotions that sometimes we don't even know we have. And so when you listen to to music like yours, that is flowing and it it is more peaceful and calm. It it really does hit a part of us that we may not even be aware of and, and kind of brings those emotions out. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm enjoying your music so much. And I'm, you know, for a change, I'm glad for something that Alan introduced me to that really has been good. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's really That's awesome, awesome of you to say. Um, you know, like Spielberg did in uh, Close Encounters, it is the universal language. And he envisioned yeah. if the aliens ever come, hopefully that we'll all be able to play the same music together. <laughs> so, right. Mm-hmm. Let me, as we start to close out with you guys, because I know what you've given, you've been so generous with your time. We do this uh, usually toward the end, but I'm just kind of curious for the, uh, for the, the Copus household. What are the movies that you guys are watching or streaming or, or what are the c- c- shows you find yourselves binging in between your recording sessions? Everybody's going to want to know, well, what are they watching? Okay. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, last night we watched, we've seen it before, but last night we watched, we got a new center speaker for our little surround system that we have. So we had to test it out with a really good sound movie. So we did Monsters vs. Aliens. Okay. Uh, oh. One of my favorite, you know, Susan. And uh, the Blob and all that, uh, Missing Link. No, I guess they don't know that movie. But <laughs> how do you know that movie? You have kids. <laughs> I, I know, I know, Monsters vs. Aliens. But oh yeah, that that one wouldn't have been in my repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> we were very much the Harry Potter family, and then Lord of the Rings, and then of course I did my education of all the Gen X movies. They had to watch all the Raiders movies. They had to watch Ghostbusters. They had to watch Gremlins as they got a little older. So, you know, the, yeah. those are the classics we bring. You know, to me, those are the classics. <laughs> We no, we, we've, we've worn out our Harry Potter Blu-rays. We I think have. We need to buy another round of them. And I mean, think about it. Over yeah. the last 17 years, you know, we, you know that, that Sarah's been here, we've watched everything from like Wonder Pets, you know, all the way up. Mm. To, you know, now we're watching uh, just, in, I mean, any movie, you know, animes and, and all kinds of different cool stuff. Studio that we never, Ghibli. Yeah. yeah that we never oh, thought we were in love. And we're just, we're great. falling in love with a whole new set of things that, that, uh, that we just wouldn't have. But I think our favorite movie. Well, I thought you were going to ask us what our favorite Gene Wilder movie. Oh, was. Oh well, I, I could get to that in a well, second. That would be but... the next question. <laughs> that would be the next That's question. That's a hard one. Okay. I know what yours is Sarah, right? Charlie oh, yeah. and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Willy Wonka. Yeah, Willy Wonka. Yeah. yeah. I I have to Thank say you, I, Willy Wonka. I, I, it's hard for me because Young Frankenstein. Oh, that's Frankenstein. Good one. Excuse me. Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good and just such and just i i never i've i can watch it for the 50th time and still be in stitches it's it's just incredible. i'm still i'm the same way i it, no matter what gene wilder movie i i watch and love i still keep coming back to young frankenstein as my favorite mm-hmm. but i have to say also that from, from my point of view that that willy wonka the way he portrayed Wonka has not been, yeah. no one has even come close. No magic. He is Willy that, Wonka. See, I read yeah. those books when I was a little, a little kid, mm-hmm. you know, I read them as part, I read all of them. There were several volumes of them. I read all of Rodal stuff. And, but that was, um, that was just one that, that when they finally made it a movie and I went to see it, I was still young and uh, it just, he was Willy Wonka. And yeah. then I've seen other people not you know, not to, like bash on Johnny Depp or anything, but not even close. A, not even not, close. Not right. Yeah. It's not with the book no. at all. No, 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 I'm a huge Tim Burton fan and a huge Johnny Depp fan, and that is a major goose egg for both of them. And I know I they were agree. trying to be different. I, they should have never even done it. Agreed. I wasn't going to say totally that, agreed. but I'm glad you did. I think Gene Wilder, who never said and a a crossword hardly ever to anybody, 
as he said, I was very disappointed. Right. Oh, I didn't oh. know he said that. Yeah. yeah. Because well, it wasn't the spirit of the book. It wasn't really the spirit of the character. It just, it didn't it feel real. No, it was creepy. Well, and he was too yeah. young. And strange. That's not the character in the book at all. Right. I, I argue this all the time. I said, the Gene Wilder version of Willy Wonka, you could still imagine running a business. He may be eccentric and crazy and wild, but he was still somebody who you could believe would run a business. The Johnny Depp version was a child who would not have any idea how to run a business. Well, yeah, and then they introduced, you know, his father, and he's a yeah, dentist, and they go off on that whole thing. That was that's weird. kind of goofy to me, yeah. I, being being a you know the a book guy. <laughs> well, then you may want to, if you are really really bored and need some sleep one night, you can go back to our very first season because that's the one we we broke down, Young Frankenstein, one minute at a time. So that was our entire first season. I think a hundred and what six episodes, Walt? A hundred and yeah, so, hundred and six. Yeah. Well, plus the final episode and the intro episode. Right. So that's wow. that's always fun. <laughs> You'll have hours minute. and hours. I'm sorry. Each one, one is one of minute of the movie. Right? Correct. So, right. So we'd spend between 25 minutes and 45 minutes talking about one minute of the movie. Yeah. It's a different format. It's definitely an interesting way to look at a movie because you start seeing things that you never noticed before. Yes. I could probably do that with Princess Bride and a couple of other ones as well. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. We, we did Princess Bride in what, 20 minute blocks? We did. We, we broke that down with our wives as a Patreon special where we broke it down. We called it the Princess Wives and uh, both of our wives joined us and broke it down and talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. We did The Big Lebowski. We did Ghostbusters. We did, I mean, we've done several movies on our Patreon side to try to help fund the 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 website or the uh, the all of the storage fee well you know how it is there's all the hosting fees storage fees publishing fees you gotta there's everybody wants a bit oh yeah yeah so um besides gene wilder then um what about other music before we let you go what music do you guys like to listen to outside of your own creations your own like what are some of your favorite bands or artists that you go to all right i'll start <laughs> i i'll be honest i don't listen to a lot of music um, I I don't have the patience to listen to a lot of music if I'm not working on it. But when I do listen to music, it's almost always classical. Okay. And, um, like I said before, I'm really really into the the romantic uh, period of, of of classical music. So Schubert, um, you know, Beethoven, of course, and even some of the pre uh, the, the the you know the, some of the classical era stuff of uh, Mozart, Haydn. Mm -hmm. And that, that there's nothing wrong with any of those. <laughs> so that's me. What about you, Pamela? Well, when I'm listening to music, it's usually something harp related. Uh, Grania Hambly, um, I don't know, Cormac de Barra. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Rachel Hare. You know, it's just yeah. usually harpists. I like listening to harp music. You don't ever go down like throw out, you know, back in black ACDC, just kind of put that <laughs> on or. Do a, do a little 1984 Van Halen. That's me. Can, I love Kansas, Kansas, Boston, ELO. Those are my go-tos if I want, you know, if I need a fix of that. Definitely. I would have to ask, do you guys, because of their, their use of symphony or symphonic type rock and sound, what about Pink Floyd? Definitely. Yes. Oh my gosh. Love Pink Floyd. Good. I, all of, all of the. <laughs> we'll the allow English, you back. No, just kidding. <laughs> all the great English and the prog rock bands, you know, ELO, uh, 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 yes, um, it, all those all rush, rush, you know, progressive rock mm -hmm. and a progressive hard rock band, uh, who I very closely followed in my rock days. And we wanted to be them, you know. Yeah, those uh, those ironically, Pink Floyd and Rush and and Walt knows this. Those are my two competing for who's my all time favorite band, and I can't figure out because there's days I'm more in the Pink Floyd mood and some in the Rush mood. But if, if I was on an island and I had the whole discography of either one, I'd be okay. When I when I hear David Gilmour play his uh, uh, his uh, what was it uh, on an island or his is that what they oh, no something blue it was a record he it's a solo record he made and um, there's a, per, a performance of it at the Albert Hall and he has a uh, gosh Crosby Stills and Nash come on and sing with him and all these oh yeah yeah it's uh, that to me is like and then they play that old Pink Floyd music it's that's just the pinnacle. Yeah, I think it is called on an island, or is it? Or maybe, yeah, on an I, island. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is on an island. Yeah, I think that is the the. Record yeah, Gilmore is an amazing guitarist. Oh, just so good. 
Uh, what about you, Sarah? I mean, you're the younger one of the group, but because uh, I have daughters, I know what they listen to. And they I do the dad thing all the time. I'm like, oh, what's with the auto tune? And they get mad at me. But, you know, music evolves and changes. What are you listening to? Um, for me, I have a really interesting music taste because I don't sit down and listen to music a lot. I mean, I like to put it on in the car sometimes or just um, if I'm working out or something. But Usually when I listen to music, I'll hear one song and I'll be like, where is that from? What is that song? And I'll look it up and I'll find it. And then it'll be stuck in my head for a week and I'll listen to it on repeat for a week. And I'm like, okay, where's the next song? It could be from like a group or like a movie or something or an intro to a show. And I'll just find that song. It's It could be like any genre, anything at all. And I'll just listen to it over and over again. So that's my music taste. Okay. So no, nothing specific. No, uh, no one artist, you know, like you're not a pink fan or something like that or. I mean, not really. It's just. <laughs> everything that's it, again there's no wrong answer because it, it's whatever you like and that's the beauty of having all of the uh, the options available to us i will tell you your generation i say this to my girls all the time and i'm 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 actually jealous of them with technology they can literally listen to anything instantaneously where mm-hmm. we used to have to go to the record store look through albums maybe they'd be playing something live and go oh who's this and then that's how we discover something new they could just go down YouTube trails or Spotify trails or just use the Amazon and just they'd make up things and say, is there a song called this? And then it would start playing something. It's just incredible. <laughs> what well, song? and you can also just ask your phone, what song is this? And boom, it's That's there. So. It's the greatest part of all the technology that you just mentioned is being able to is being in the, the grocery store. OK, getting a bread or something. And then you, what is that? And then you put your phone up and it and it's. And she tells you what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. It's incredible. Well, somehow I, I knew that y- none of y'all were going to say like Hannah Montana. None of y'all were going <laughs> to say, you know, any of the the more modern stuff that it, it seems like y'all. What's really funny is I think Walt thinks Hannah music. Montana is modern. <laughs> I did not say that. That was <laughs> my kid's favorite, I guess. It seems like yesterday, but I know. Less- I used to watch the show with them all the time, but you yes. know they grow up. <laughs> I was subjected to that. Yeah, what do your kids listen to? Mine are all over the place, but uh, like Panic at the Disco is huge yeah. for them. Love mm-hmm. Panic at the Disco. Um, they love uh, Maroon Five. Um, they really like uh, Billie Eilish. Obviously, that's a big hobby. They like Pink. Um, they're like, oh, what's the? Uh... Oh my god, the name was gonna go right out of my head, but she's uh, she started off country, but then does pop rock instead, and she kind of has that controversy. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yes, yeah. they love Taylor mm-hmm. Swift. Um, they do like uh, uh, whatever her name is that was Hannah Montana. They do like her music, but um, I, I, I try to I try to steer them away from her because she's a bit of a weird influence. And now I'm like, you don't need to. You can like her music, but you don't need to be like her. So well, you can't unsee the wrecking ball, you know. No, no unfortunately, no. or mm-hmm. other things she's done. So anyway, that's, I don't want to take us down a dark path, but that's that's where my girls are. But you know what? My girls, we could, and we did this. We were on a cruise. We, we did a family cruise before my eldest went to college. We were like, this is the last family vacation. We're going to probably be all together because you're going to be going your own separate ways. And on the cruise, they always have these like days where they have things like trivia night in this area or wherever you could go while you're at sea. And we did a music trivia contest where all the people who wanted to show up and between their knowledge of all the songs of the late 90s, the 2000s, and then my knowledge of all the 70s and 80s and my wife's knowledge of the 70s and 80s, we actually got a little gold trophy for it, for, for uh, music <laughs> trivia. Because they would play a little of the song and, then, and that was it. And then you'd have to write it down and then turn it in, which you thought the song, like the song title and artist. So you would have to know the song. It wasn't like facts. It was like, can you recognize this song? And they wouldn't let yeah. you, they wouldn't play the chorus or anything that would let, give away the title, but you had to put the title and artist and we, we aced it. It was awesome. Wow. That's, that's cool. great. <laughs> One of the things I've never had a music ability, like, like to, to write or anything, but I could probably be on name that tune. I could do it. You, I mean, yeah. I, I, my wife was like, how do you oh, know in like yeah, two you notes? Could. Yeah, you could. It's crazy. I name that tune. That was a great little contest so that they would have, like, they tell you a little bit of something about the song. And then I can name that tune in one note. And it'd be like, bump. And, and then they would know, you know? It's crazy. Guys, I know we're taking up more time than I, than I said. I always try to keep it a little an hour. But you've been so much fun to talk to. And I really do Absolutely. appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to be with us here on the Wilder Ride inside our listeners' lounge. 
Thank you for having, Thank you for having Thank you. us. It it's fun. been absolutely mm-hmm. fun. One last time, yeah. let everyone know how they learn a whole lot more about you and where they go to buy Hummingbird out now digitally. And by the time this hits, um, in fact, we don't want to date it because people could stumble across this podcast years from now, but they can find it also physical copy. But where can they go to learn more about you and the album? You can find out more about 2002 on our website. It's www.2002music.com. And uh, Amazon, Spotify, Pandora, Apple, iTunes. Yeah, if you want to stream it, we have a little, uh, don't we have on our website a little place where you can, and you can see all the, you can click on it, see all the different places you can stream it. So you can just pick whichever platform, if it's Amazon or if it's Spotify Mm -hmm. or whatever, and just pick your platform and just, and it'll click you right to it. Mm -hmm. Folks, stream away, listen, buy, support. Sign up for the newsletter, check out their YouTube channel, subscribe, so that way you'll know when new videos drop and new uh, new songs are, are available to check out and watch or just listen to. They put playlists out there as well, so if you just want a particular playlist, it'll be, and that's what I do when we've gone out camping, I'll just click a playlist and just fall asleep listening to, you know, the Celtic uh, fairy tales and, and other just take me away as I fall asleep in the out, outdoors. They're great. I have loved them since River of Stars, and uh, you cannot go wrong with these guys. Pamela, Randy, and Sarah, thanks so much for being here on The Wilder Ride. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank appreciate you. It. We really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. And boy, Walt, that was just so cool to be able to have the the musicians, the artists. Uh, what a talented family, uh, that trio, to be able to create the kind of music they do and to then take time out of their schedule to be with us. Oh, no kidding. I, I've said this before that I admire musicians, but I am the furthest thing from a musician. So whenever we have somebody who can actually make an instrument, make music, I'm always impressed. Ditto. I mean, I think you and I both compensate for our inability to play by how much we love to listen and discuss what we hear and try to maybe pass on a different way of understanding music. And that's from the listener or from the the ear of the fan. Yeah, and as I get older, I appreciate more and more um, the different styles of music and different genres. So it was great to have them on. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to plowing through more more of their music. And, you know, now I feel like we've met three new friends. So right. uh, it makes you enjoy the music even more. Well, um, for folks who uh, didn't know their background, I didn't ask them this, but uh, just as we transition to our movie segment, I mean, it's incredible. Randy plays piano, electric cello, guitar, bass, and keyboards. Pam plays flutes, as you heard her say, and harp, but also keyboards and wind instruments. And both musicians provide all of the vocals on all of their albums, recording their voices many times over, layering them to create that virtual choir with a celestial, angelic quality. It's amazing. It's insane. That that is just insane talent. Mm -hmm. It is. Very few people can do what they do and not only do it well, but repeatedly do it. They've got, I think, 14 albums now. It's <laughs> That's crazy. It's amazing. And their daughter really has an amazing voice. When she started singing some of the lead stuff, when she became kind of like their, their, their lead solo vocalist, she is every bit as good in terms of the command of her voice as Enya on her earlier albums. Well, it's funny when you have two parents that are that, are that musically talented, you kind of wonder, okay, is the kid going to be like a softball player or... You know, that would be my obviously. <laughs> yeah. Right. But obviously she's, you know, picked up the family genes for music. And, yeah. Uh, so that's that's incredible talent. Well, hopefully uh, with the, the the pandemic over, uh, at least for most of us that uh, have realized the pandemic's on, over. Yes. We'll that, declare it right here. You know what? People are going to get out there. They're going to want to hear music again. They're going to want to be out together. This is the kind of stuff you can have playing and just feel good and positive and uplifting. And and no matter where you are in life, it's always good to have that kind of music to turn to. Yeah. Do you have any tickets for any concerts yet? No. Uh, I've gone to see live performances. Oh, that's right. But yep. there, you, I can't afford to go to a concert anymore, dude. I don't know. When did no, it go right. from a high school a high school kid could afford to go to like a concert almost every other weekend? I remember going to Turtles on the way to school and thinking how early it was to be standing in line at 7 a.m. Like school oh, don't yeah. even start till eight 30 and I'm here at seven getting tickets and I would get tickets to everything and it would be yeah. like 15 or 20 bucks. It's like 200 now. I was going to say, I remember spending my first $20 bill on a concert and just thinking, man, this has gotten outrageous. 
So yeah, it's crazy. I am crazy. so big into supporting live music and live musicians, especially some of the really good cover bands that, that go around in Atlanta and North Atlanta area or yeah. um, tribute bands. There's a lot of really good tribute bands that just recreate the feel of the classic bands. And you know what? I know they're not the real band, but I'm at the point in my life where I'm in a bar or I'm in a, I'm in a restaurant or I'm in a venue where it's usually me and people I care about and we're just having a great time. And that's all I care about. Right. Well, and if you um, listen to some of our, you know, favorite bands from um, when we were growing up, they're not those bands anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> the voices are shot. The, you know, David Lee Roth can't jump anymore. It's, uh, David Lee Roth is horrible. Period. Is can horrible. we just say, can we just he say is. he had his moment and I love 1984, maybe one of my all time favorite Van Halen records or albums. It's cover to cover. One of the best, I think. Yeah. Great, ones with David album. Lee Roth. But I think I think Sammy Hagar took them musically to a completely new level, and and I love all the Hagar stuff. Yeah, and they're almost like two different bands, but still, um, both great. Yeah, but I think if they had stayed with Roth, they would have never gotten as big or as popular as they did as wide ranging because Hagar was about the music and Roth was yeah. about the the ego. Oh yeah, I agree. I, I think that they would. I, I they were topping out where they were I, I don't think they could have done much more. and don't get me wrong i got david lee roth's solo album i thought you know some of the stuff he did was great but when he started turning into this lizard lounge act i'm like i don't know what you're doing it, it's yeah. it's horrifying so the rest of the band didn't know either and that's <laughs> no. why we have uh van hagar <laughs> well speaking of horrifying it's time for us to dive into your movie review a segment yes. we like to call All right, Walt, what did our loyal listeners in our Facebook group, our listeners group, what did they pick for you this week? Well, I think we all know what was picked this week. And uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, our guest last week for um, (laughs) inciting violence against my soul (laughs) and getting everybody to vote for the 1995 Kevin Costner disaster, Waterworld. Now, you'll if you'll note, I did not vote for Waterworld. I would I voted for Killer Bees. I noticed that, and I, you know, Killer Bees is going to have to make another appearance because I, it looks like a really good bad movie. <laughs> this is a movie that people should be ashamed of because it's actually like a feature film made by actual studios and starring Kevin Costner, who, by some people's standards, is a star. <laughs> and we all know water world you know 1985 two hours and 15 minutes of burning crap <laughs> um you've got imdb but i'll read it to you since you voted for it uh their breakdown or their summary in a future where the polar ice caps have melted and earth is almost entirely submerged which is a spoiler in and of itself, a mutated mariner, also a spoiler, fights starvation and outlaw smokers and reluctantly helps a woman and a young girl try to find dry land. They could have also included Hollywood star shows no apparent talent (laughs) and reads the driest lines in the history of cinema. You, You could have also said, Kevin Reynolds does all he can to bore his audiences into oblivion. This is not a great movie, folks. This movie sucks. <laughs> I I saw it in probably 96, 97, and my memory of it was that it was terrible. Trying to go into this, I like I was trying to have a good attitude and trying to say, you know what? It was probably just a bad day. I watched it during a snowstorm. Somebody hit my truck in the parking lot that day. You know, just trying to figure mentally I was not all there when I watched this movie. I may have been more angry watching it this time than I was last time. It is just not good. There's so much bad acting. There's so much. And and, and there's bad overacting. Uh, I mean, it is just such a terrible movie. And uh, even for a feature film, like half the people on the list don't have pictures on IMDb. <laughs> this is a feature film. Like get actors who are good. <laughs> I don't even know if that could have salvaged it. 
It is not Kevin Costner at his best. Um, the Highwaymen is Kevin Costner at his best, by the way, in my opinion. Kevin Costner um, has some really, really good movies in his repertoire. I will argue you're right. This one is not it. This is not it. I, and I would say Kevin Even Costner Dennis to Hopper me, as the villain doesn't help the movie. I, this is the only movie that Dennis Hopper's in that I do not like Dennis Hopper. I just felt like, you know, there's the scene where they give him the glass eye. And I, I don't know whether he just didn't care at that point or the writing was just so bad or the direct. I don't know what was going on, but Dennis Hopper was terrible. And, uh, you know, other people are going to disagree with me, but I, I just felt like he was phoning it in through half of this movie or that the direction and writing was just so bad that even he couldn't salvage it because I mean, name another movie where you're like, Oh, Dennis Hopper was terrible. You can't do it. Dennis Hopper's a great, a great actor. Mm -hmm. This is not a good movie. This is a, this is a burning sack of garbage. And well, let me ask you though, because you've seen so many horrible movies without a budget. Is this, could it not turn into if you, if you, if you like temper down your anger that this was the movie selected, couldn't this be a good, bad movie? No. And you know why? Okay. Because the budget was $175 million. In 95? In 1995, $175 million. For $175 million, everybody should have gone dancing out of the theater happy. I don't know if anybody went dancing out of the theater awake. It was so bad. The opening weekend made $21 million. The actual U.S. gross, and remember, they it was a $175 million budget. Guess what the gross was in the U.S.? Overall, when it finished? Yep. Uh, did it pass $100 million? No. Wow. Didn't even... $88.2 million. Whoops. So a lot of people agree with me. <laughs> this is not a good movie. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to put this in perspective because... My all-time favorite, as we all know, is Lord of the Rings. And it was the first movie dropped in 2001 with the next part in 2002 and then the final in 2003. Three movies, all three of them, the theatrical releases were three plus hours, the extended editions on Blu-ray and DVD, three and a half to four and a half hours each. They spent $300 million on all three. $100 million wow. a movie. That's crazy. And that was done five years later. So obviously Peter Jackson knew how to spend the money better and how to tell a better story. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I, and I don't know really what they were going for this movie. I know exactly I that, what it was. And, and it's, 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 it's main problem is the one main comparison. It's Mad Max, the road warrior no, on no, water. Right, right. That that's what they were going Instead for. Instead of a tanker truck to get their gas somewhere, they're looking for land. Everyone that's a, a brigand, they're all the, the group of the humongous, and everybody else is is a is a wasteland wanderer, and he's Mad Max, but on the water. Yeah, and you have the smokers. I mean, it's it's obvious that that's what they were trying to capture. They didn't capture it. I cannot unthink or unsee that when I watch the movie, I'm just like, oh, okay. You wanted to do the Road Warrior, but you didn't you didn't want to set it in the desert or the wasteland because that's already been done. So what's the opposite of desert? Well, let's just put it on right. the water. Well, and you also get to throw in, even in 1995, you get to throw in a little global warming uh, preaching. and, and Well, yeah, that. because but, the, the, the caps were supposed to have melted by now. That's right. That's right. So now there is one redeeming moment of this movie. Can you guess what that redeeming moment is for me? When the credits roll? Okay, there are two redeeming <laughs> moments in this movie. <laughs> the, the one really redeeming movie before the credits, the one redeeming part before the credits, is there's an old man down in the um, in the oil hold uh, in that big tanker, mm -hmm. and uh, Kevin Costner drops the flare down there, and it hits the oil and ignites it, and the guy goes, "Oh, thank God!" and the whole room just explodes and he dies. I, I think that me and a lot of the other audience members were like, "Oh, thank God, this movie's about to end." <laughs> So that's the one redeeming part of this movie. So um, in one I, in one encapsulated scene, that is your review of Waterworld. A flare dropped into a well where a man is going, thank God, you've put me <laughs> out of my misery. That's right. And it ends. <laughs> so 
But uh, you know, there are two things that I want to mention. It got a, it has a six point two on IMDb, but I think that's really generous. Um, I I don't know why it has that. I think that the the money tells us a whole lot more than that rating does. Um, but also, um, there is a director's cut for this movie that is a hundred and seventy six minutes. The Cinematic is 135. I cannot fathom what 176 minutes of Waterworld has to be like. I mean, maybe you show it at Gitmo or the night before someone's executed just to make their life seem a whole lot longer. <laughs> I don't know why you would sit down and watch a director's cut 176 minutes of this movie unless you just hate yourself. So I don't even. It, So my ultimate review is don't watch it. It's terrible. It's not even a good cult classic. It's garbage. But thank you for allowing me to watch this one more time just to confirm to myself that I hate this movie. You know, I would actually give the director's cut a try because I will. I I felt (laughs) like when I went to go see the movie and honestly, I've only seen it a couple of times since just because. I'm a big road warrior fan. And because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is just road warrior on the water. And so I kind of enjoy watching practical stunts and I don't mind as contrived and as stupid as the movie is. There are some good practical stunts. There is some good stunt work. And, you know, half the budget was spent because this dumbass Kevin Reynolds said, let's go out where no one can see land. And they, anybody can tell you the minute you're on water and you have to go out that far, you have no control of lighting. You have no control of in the background. You have no control of the tide. It's hard. There was no reason to do what they did for this story, but they wanted to do it. And they were hoping that, you know, that Kevin Costner was gold and Kevin Reynolds was gold. They had great movie. I mean, whether you like Prince of Thieves or not, that movie made a ton of money and put both of them on a, on a, on a comet ride to where neither one could do any wrong until this movie. Yes. And that movie is a whole lot better than this one. A whole lot better. Well, I I would give the 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 director's cut a go. I may I may do that and just let you know what I think of it. So, all right. Well, anything else you want to say, or can we move on to our news segment? There is nothing else I want to say about that movie ever again. Let's head on over to our news segment, a segment we like to call "It's No Bullshit." Walt, what's your first story? All right, from CTVN news of canada we have this great headline 17th century european paintings found in roadside dumpster something smells rotten around here oh that's nice why can't i ever find them yeah no kidding uh police are appealing for information on how two original paintings from 17th century european artists ended up in a roadside dumpster in southeast germany the framed oil paintings were found by a 65 year, or 64 year old man at a highway service station in the Bavaria region last month. The man later handed the paintings to police in the western city of Cologne, the police department told us. Officers have launched an appeal to the owners of the painting. An initial assessment from an art expert concluded the paintings were likely original works, the police said. One of the paintings is a smiling self portrait of Italian Pietro. Bellarutio, dating back to 1665. <laughs> Some art student is going to hate me for this. Um, I'm hating you artist, for it right now. <laughs> <laughs> the artist is best known for painting portraits, according to the Galleria Cesario in Switzerland. I'm sure that's exactly how that's pronounced. The artist worked for highly prominent families in, Vien- in Venice and beyond, including patrons such as Cardinal uh, Ottoboni and the governor of Milan. The other painting is of a grinning boy in red cape, date unknown, by a Dutch artist named Samuel von Hugenstragen. Uh, Hugenstragen, also perfectly pronounced, <laughs> was a painter and writer who trained under Rembrandt in Amsterdam, according oh. to uh, some collection that I'm not going to try to pronounce. One of the world's largest private collections of works of the Dutch Golden Age. In the later, in the latter part of the 17th century, the the elite of the Hogue lined up to sit for Hugenstragen's paint, uh, portraits of the collection. The art, also known as oh, the artist also wrote an introduction to the High School of Art Painting, which was published the year he died of 1678. It includes 
stories of his time in, in Rembrandt studios. So these are two classic paintings found in a dumpster at a gas station along the roadside. It's no bullshit. And they have no idea how they got there. Did they did they say where they came from? Mm-mm, nobody knows. Like somebody's like somebody may have gotten robbed and then the people freaked out because this was a private collection and they just dumped it. Dumped it in the trash can. That is wild. Yeah, you know, and that kind of goes with we we've talked about these before on your show of, you know, somebody goes to Goodwill, buys something cool, and then it, it turns out it's some, you know, classic painting that's been missing for years. Mm. That is that is amazing. I I never get that luck. You know, I end up spending uh, like $2 at the thrift store and find out that I actually spent $2 too much for what it was worth. Right. I right. never get the opposite. No, yeah, no, me neither. So anyway, that's uh, that's that. If you find, uh, or if you're missing two 17th century portraits, they've been found. You need to contact the Cologne Police Department. All right. I've got the next story here, and this one's a little strange, but... Uh, Do you like vanilla flavored, like vanilla flavored ice cream or vanilla? Okay, well, did you know that we're pretty much very rarely actually eating the vanilla bean flavor? We're we're eating something called vanillin, which is used in the food industry. It's not actually part of the vanilla bean. It's actually a chemical version of what comes out of fossil fuels. This is damn peculiar. Oh, fantastic. I don't know if you knew that. No wonder we're also healthy. Yeah, uh, like this this vanilla extract is when you're having actual vanilla, whereas vanilla flavoring is more than likely something that came out of an oil derivative. Beautiful. So check this out. Because there is such global demand for vanillin, as it's called, which is the fake vanilla, which gives you still the vanilla flavor, they, uh, they realize, well, it comes out of fossil fuels. Well, you know what else is made out of fossil fuels? Plastic bottles. <laughs> Great. So check this out. Wouldn't it be great if we could make more vanilla easily while at the same time cutting down on plastic waste? Well, thankfully, thanks to some scientists in Edinburgh, now we can. A research team from the University of Edinburgh have developed a method to transform waste plastic bottles into vanilla. In the future, when you have your vanilla ice cream, you might actually be eating the remnants of old Coca-Cola bottles. I think that would be extraordinarily dangerous. Oh, super. The research, published in the journal Green Chemistry, builds on previous studies. The earlier discoveries showed that we could turn bottles made from polyethylene into something called terephthalic acid. On its own, the acid isn't good for eating. Apart from plastic bottles, it's used to make drugs, paints, and military smoke grenades. What? Yes, yeah, so we already know how to make terephthalic acid, but check this out. When you break the plastic down, researchers from Edinburgh found it's possible to turn the terephthalic acid into vanilla. All you need to do is add a little E. coli. Oh, that's not right. Oh, perfect. Yes. That, <laughs> Isn't this that, getting better? There you go. This is better and better. The same yep. bacteria that makes you poop your guts out. <laughs> <laughs> is what will help break down the chemical structure of the plastic and turn it into the flavoring that we will now put into ice cream. Awesome. Luckily, in this case, the bacteria have been genetically modified. Apparently, uh, this acid and uh, and vanillin are so similar in chemical structure, the bacteria only needs to make some minor changes to the acid. So to get the results they wanted, the scientists threw in some of the bacteria into a batch of the acid They then heated the concoction to 98.6, which should sound familiar as our body temperature, and let it sit for 24 hours. Their results were very promising. The modified E. coli turned roughly 79% of the acid into vanilla. According to researchers, the resulting vanilla would be fit for human consumption. In the same breath, though, they add that more research is needed to fine-tune the process and meet food regulatory standards. It's... No bullshit. But yep, in the future, not too long from now, that vanilla flavored uh, Coke or ice cream or whatever may have been some plastic bottles that have been decomposed by E. coli and turned into vanilla. Why don't we just use vanilla beans to make it? There's not enough vanilla bean. There's so much demand for vanilla. That's why we have to chemically create an alternative to make the vanilla flavor without coming from the bean. I'm going to start growing vanilla beans in my No kidding, dude. (laughs) We might be able to make a fortune as well. Yeah, I was going to say. And hopefully nobody will steal them and leave them by the side of the road. (laughs) All right. Well, I've got our next news story. 
Georgia Boy Scout finds empty lot after booking Airbnb rentals in Big Pine Key, Florida. Whoops. From WSVN.com News 7 Miami. A trip to the Florida Keys got off to a sour start for two groups of Boy Scouts from Georgia who said they secured accommodations through Airbnb for a house that doesn't even exist. Speaking with 7 News on Friday, troop leader Scott Mulkey uh, said his, his troop 5506 and 506 from Northeast Georgia had planned their Florida, Florida Keys getaway from some, some sort some, Never mind. Can you give me a good take on that? <laughs> Scott Mulkey said his troop 5506 and 506 from Northeast Georgia had planned their four. You know what? Never mind. Their trip to the Keys <laughs> for some snorkeling, fishing, and camping. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a once in a lifetime sort of thing that most of the scouts do, he said. Mulkey said it was nearly impossible to contain their excitement about the out- upcoming outdoor adventure. It's just a good time for us to make some memories with our scouts, he said. For part of the trip, the troops booked two Airbnb rentals that could hold all 24 of the boys. Before they even made it to South Florida, they started to realize both of their separate bookings seemed off. That's because, as Mulkey said, it appeared they had rented the same house through different hosts. The pictures were all exactly identical and all for Big Pine Key, he said. After reaching out to Airbnb, the host Mulkey, the host, host told Mulkey that the listings were legitimate. They remained skeptical but continued on their way. But once they showed up this week, they arrived to find mangroves and marshlands. Uh oh. There's no mailbox. There's not anything there, said Mulkey. <laughs> After finding an empty lot, he recorded a video to document his disappointment and frustration. I can imagine. He did. It's supposed to be a brand new home near the beach. Exactly (laughs) what is supposed to be there for rental, he said. As he stood in the middle of the empty lot, explain to me. (laughs) How is this not fraud? There's no home here. There's no address here. There's absolutely nothing here. Ever resourceful, the scouts reorganized and paid for rooms at a hotel. Airbnb spokesman Ben Brett said they are going to fully refund them. In a statement, he wrote, this type of situation is extremely rare, but when it happens, we take action to protect the integrity of our platform. To that end, these listings have been removed and all associated hosts have been suspended pending further investigation. It's no bullshit. So uh, there you go. Be careful with those Airbnbs. At least check Google Maps. And right. Make sure, that that building make sure there's actually a structure on the plot where you're planning to go. Yeah, but, you know, mangroves and swampland, not your best vacation. Well, no, no, <laughs> not, not my idea of a good time. But I do like that the uh, the, the Boy Scouts didn't just say, oh, you know, it's wilderness. We're Boy Scouts. Let's camp. And they're like, where's the holiday in? Where's the pool? <laughs> Well, I don't camp. If I, I can't have a breakfast buffet, then I'm not. I'm not having breakfast. I'm not having vacation. Huh. No pool. No. No room. That's like, how are we supposed to camp? <laughs> yeah, the 21st century Boy Scout. Where's the valet? <laughs> Where's room this is service? Take me into my bed. <laughs> Where's room service? <laughs> All right, I've got the last news story. I'm going to pick us up, and I'm going to give us a bit of inspiration, because you and I, I think we both are exactly the same when it comes to our four-legged friends. We love them dearly. They provide nothing but laughter and joy and merriment. They are a member of our family. They'll cuddle up on our couches, in our beds. They are with us. They are like our children. Well, guess what? A new study just came out, and I was always wondering if somebody would look at this. I just was wondering, how amazing is it that puppies can immediately bond and graft to us as human beings and become our best friends. Well, a study just recently conducted said that puppies know from birth how to communicate with people. You're on mute. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. I'm going to try to sum this up. It was so hard to kind of cut the article down. So in, in, in the, um, in deference to brevity, since we're running long, the fresh research published in the journal Current Biology found puppies 
are born with a degree of knowledge in how to communicate with people. In other words, your pooch is already hardwired to be a good dog and follow commands. Wow. According to the study's lead author, Emily Bray, a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Arizona, there's been a question of when exactly did dogs learn how to socialize with people? Bray said, quote, There was evidence that these sorts of social skills were present in adulthood, but here we find evidence that puppies, sort of like humans, are biologically prepared to interact in social ways. Not only that, the researchers discovered why some dogs are better at following orders than others. According to them, it comes down to genetics. Basically, I'm going to summarize what they did to kind of study this. They watched for how much a particular breed or a dog in and of itself would look eye to eye with the person. The more a dog was apt to look you in the eye when you were trying to give it commands, it would more likely understand what to do or at least have a sense of the expectation and would learn more quickly than dogs that wouldn't necessarily look you in the eye. That's not to say that your dog can't still learn, but that it showed from the very onset without anything else that puppies within eight weeks of being born and they're starting to see further because their eyesight is so, like like a human baby's, their eyesight doesn't reach as far until it develops a little sure. bit, that they can actually read your body language, your tone, and have a sense of, oh, you're expecting me to do something. I want to do it for you for no other reason than to please you. And that according to this study, because of that, puppies already know how to communicate with people. It's like hardwired into their longstanding DNA since they've been domesticated down from the wolf. They are ready to please you as long as you are ready to teach and be with your dog. Not just throw it on a chain and put it outside, but to literally be the parent. This dog actually acts like a lot of infants, not knowing your language, but still trying to figure out how to please you. It's amazing. It's astounding. But it's no bullshit. That is really amazing research. I, and I can tell you, neither one of my dogs fit into that category of making eye contact and doing what they're told. <laughs> well, maybe make him make eye contact. Oh, Moose will make eye contact with me. But he's like, why are you talking? Dude, I have done this in my last uh, several weeks with all of my dogs because I do five of them at once feeding them dinner. And it's crazy how they're slowly learning from my most like difficult dog to my most obedient, I will not pour food in their bowl until I have them sit. I'll say sit. And if they won't sit, I don't pour food. And once I pour the food, if they, if they go before I say, okay, I take the food back up and throw it back in the bin. I'm like, no, no, sit. I've got them all now to where I can pour the food in the bowl. And they look at me and I actually say, look at me. And when they make eye contact with me, I say, okay. And then they go eat. And I'm slowly wow. now turning that, that time of okay just a little bit longer. I've gotten to the point where two of my more obedient dogs, I can wait almost 20 seconds and they'll just sit there. Now they're looking at me like, you're going to say okay? You're going to say okay? You're going to say okay? And finally when I say okay, instantaneous like head in the bowl chowing away. But it's awesome to watch these dogs when you make that eye contact, they're learning what I want them to do at dinner time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. I am always amazed by people who know how to train dogs really well. I, I tend to be that kind of dog owner who says, you know what? I love my dogs. I want to play with my dogs. As long as they sort of come and they sort of do what I want them to do, that's about as much as my training. I just spoil them like rotten, filthy little children. But um, I'm trying to be a little bit better about training. Yeah, and they will learn. They will. Dogs are not you know, dumb. Uh, uh, people always ask me like, isn't that mean? Like, no, dogs need to know Gosh, who's in no. control. And if it's not you, it's going to be them. Yeah, absolutely. They need someone to be the alpha. That, that They're a pack animal. And if you understand that, you can train any dog. They don't mind being disciplined. They don't mind. I mean, disciplined in a, in a good way. I don't mean beating your dog. Oh, yeah, right. They understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You want me to act a particular way. You want me to develop a certain behavior. When you do that and I, and when the dog does it and you reward them and they realize you're in charge. They're happy. They love it. Like, you're in charge. You're calling the shots. As long as you keep giving me food, I'm good. That's right. They, and they understand that clearly. All right. That's it for news. Time for our entertainment segment. 
And this is the segment where we are telling you what we're watching, what we're reading, and what we're listening to. Walt, we've gone extraordinarily long, so let's knock this out of the park. Let's start with watching. What have you been watching? Well, I'm going to make it real, real simple this week. I've just started watching a series called Formula One Drive to Survive on Netflix. I've heard several people talk about it, and I'm about halfway through episode one, and it is pretty cool so far. It's just kind of behind the scenes of Formula One racing. I've never been a Formula One fan, but it is pretty fascinating. And then also on Hulu, um, I think I've mentioned this. I've been watching Seinfeld on and off. And I have started watching MASH again. And I always say, I'm just going to watch one episode. (laughs) Yeah. And then like four episodes later, I'm still watching. MASH is the Lay's potato chip of sitcoms. It really is. It really is. No one can watch just one. No. Mm -mm. And I think I'm into season two now. It's just cool to watch the evolution of the show and how it, uh, it took a little while to find itself, but it it grew up pretty fast and became a great, uh, great show. So it, particularly if you've never watched it before, I would highly recommend checking it out on Hulu. Do you have any other ones? Uh, <laughs> I do, but I'm going to uh, save those. I know coming up is going to be the uh, release of Ted Lasso. That's coming to uh, Apple TV again soon. Uh, I think season three is about to come out. So we'll talk more about that when it comes out in the next couple of weeks. All right. Um, with my father-in-law visiting, we've been watching a lot more movie and television than I normally do, but uh, which is fine. It gives me something to talk about in this segment. We did, in fact, we watched a Kevin Costner flick. We, it's one of my wife's absolute all-time favorites. I got to be honest, it's sort of like the comic book version of Robin Hood, but it's still fun. I don't mind it. Robin yeah. Hood, Prince of Thieves, watched it the other night. It's got its goofy moments. It is not as true to the to the to the the storyline of robin hood doesn't matter it's fun every time i watch it it is good it's a good movie um watched a liam neeson flick uh honest thief came out a few uh months ago it was basically a story of a bank robber who decided he wanted to turn himself in and unfortunately turned himself into two crooked fbi agents who decided hey this guy's willing to turn himself in he's got nine million dollars from all these bank jobs he's done we're just going to steal the money and frame him It was really good. It that was is a, interesting. It I'll, was a typical Liam Neeson. I'm gonna show you how to. I'm gonna kill you in the end. You know, kind of his Liam Neeson taken kind of role. But oh, it yeah. was it was fresh. It was fun. I enjoyed it. It was only an hour and a half. Obviously, not that doesn't make it a great movie, but it I it, it held my attention. So check out Honest Thief. And I just decided to find a new series to watch. I don't know. Sometimes I just go through and start looking at all the previews and realize there's more series and more limited shows than I'll ever have time to watch. Unlike last week's guest, I don't have that much free time, but I decided I love Tim Roth as an actor. And I came across a show he did starting in 2017, at least season one was 2017, filmed in Canada called Tin Star. He plays a a cop from London who got too too deep and too involved in the big city of London and it nearly crushed his family. We're slowly learning a little bit about him. He suffered from drug, ad- drug abuse and alcoholism. Decided, I love to be in law enforcement, but I can't stay in London. Moves to the Canadian Rockies in a very small town in Canada to become the sheriff of this town. And I will tell you, I've only watched two episodes so far. I have never felt my heart hammering in my chest more for the tension of a series than just the first two episodes. I have no idea if they can sustain it, but as far as a show, I haven't had this kind of a visceral reaction since maybe Bosch. It was that good. So I would highly recommend checking out Tin Star. It's on Amazon Prime. Awesome. I'll definitely watch that. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I just want to go binge the whole thing now just to see how season one's going to end. I am, I'm blown away just in two episodes and it may not sustain. I don't know how many episodes. I, have, I didn't even look how many, how many seasons there are. It just was compelling enough after one episode that I watched the second. And if it hadn't been for Father's Day, I probably would have been still in front of the TV. Okay, good. Just added it to my watch list. All right. I'm going to go through my YouTube very quickly. Ashley Burton, which is the channel I love. She's a millennial who does movies. I watched her movies this week. A review of Tremors, Caddyshack, Ed Wood, and Smokey and the Bandit. Laughed through every one of them. Loved it. And you would love her too. She is just such a funny millennial trying to watch movies that she's never seen before doing her reactions. Speaking of reactions, Popcorn in Bed is another one I really like. Cassie is a, is cute as a button from Canada. 
she decided to invite her sister over and they both watched Jaws for the oh. very first time. And to see a reaction video of two sisters who have never seen Jaws was priceless. It was awesome. Obviously, our guest from a few weeks ago, The Daily Doug. I always check out The Daily Doug, especially his Iron Maiden Mondays. And speaking of Iron Maiden, the charismatic voice is the final YouTube channel I always catch when she has a new video out. She did Iron Maiden's Fear of the Dark, a live broadcast of it, uh, analyzing Bruce Dickinson and Iron Maiden's performance of Fear of the Dark. She is also cute as a button, a trained opera singer, looking at these metal singers and how they go about belting these these lyrics and and yet run around on stage and and she's all the time she says how do they do this how do they perform that kind of energy one song after another and not lose their voice she's like blown away and she's an opera singer like world renowned and so it's it's fantastic so those are the things i've been watching very cool all right reading walt oh i've got a couple things going but nothing really worth mentioning that i haven't talked about already i just need to get done with some things i'm in the exact same boat my big one is the uh, star trek book you got me the uh the 50 year mission the first 25 years so i think both of us are trying to make our way through that book you know what we probably ought to do is uh first episode of next season just uh Give our thoughts on that book, because it looks like it's going to take that long for us to get it done. It, well, with as much as going on with our lives right now, it very well could be. I mean, you know what? Life happens. I tell people that all the time. It it's okay. Life happens. So, all right. Absolutely. Let's get to what we're listening to, Walt. Okay. Um, two that I've recommended before. One I may have, but wanted to re- uh, mention again. First, I'm listening to this series called Camp Hell in Awakey, and it is... um like driving by a bad car wreck it's hard to listen to some of it and to think that people actually went through this in the united states of america it is it is bad i mean it's really crushing and terrible but it is definitely worth listening to um and heeding what they're talking about that this guy was just allowed to run amok because of political and uh community ties and he abused a bunch of kids horribly and made a whole lot of money doing it. So that's Camp Hell and Awakey. Uh, also, Smartless this week, they uh, interviewed David Cross, who also, uh, as with. He's a uh, never nude. He is a never nude. He was uh, from uh, Arrested Development, as are two of the other hosts. And uh, David Cross has always been fascinating to me. Um, he's now a father. He's like 47 years old. Uh, he's a new father. Still so younger than Tim through. Andrews. A little bit younger, not much. (laughs) But um, if you know anything about David Cross and his uh, comedy and everything, it's crazy. Uh, He does not have nice things to say about the uh, Atlanta, Georgia area, but he grew up in a different time. Um, But definitely uh, an interesting interview, so check that out. And then finally, uh, Stuff You Should Know. If you have not listened to that, it's uh, also Atlanta-based. But they go into all kinds of different scientific stuff or, um, you know, old wives tales and whatever. And it's just um, stuff you should know. It, they go into the science of a virus or they go into, um, you know, how cars were built, you know, how Ford became Ford. And it's always done really, really well. Uh, always very entertaining. And it'll definitely keep your uh, keep your attention through the whole episode, usually about an hour. They've had a couple on rare diseases that have been really, really cool. So check that out again. Stuff you should know. All right. I've got three right off the bat. Obviously, our guests today are a staple in my household. So if you have not streamed 2002 and you haven't already been compelled to put in your order for Hummingbird, do it. You're not going to go wrong. Radio Labyrinth has a podcast, one of my all-time favorites. I keep it going all the time. They drop episodes twice a week. I know Tim was out for a couple of those episodes, and they still kept going. Uh, great stuff, and those guys are always fun. Awesome. And my good friends over the, across the pond, 60MW Podcast, always a lot of fun. Also fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And and look back through all the other episodes we've done, even this season. Almost all those ep- though those podcasts come through, depending on when they have a new episode. So. And, you know, I, a new one, I just saw a new one for the, the History of the Marine Corps drop. That That's another one that I've mentioned multiple times. I just haven't listened to it yet. So once I do, I will mention it in this segment. But any ones we've ever mentioned, you should go ahead and just subscribe. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be recommending them if we didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, I was about to mention the Rocky Minute. 
I know those guys are going to work on the next uh, the next movie, but if you haven't watched one and two or haven't listened to one and two, go listen to their first and second season. Those are just hilarious and awesome. Some hysterical uh, audio to just listen to. Oh, just great. Two Philadelphia cops giving their breakdown of Rocky. They're and ju- they even they're, have they're, us on there several times. I got to correct you, though, because they're going to be mad if we do. They're two Jersey cops. Oh, I'm sorry. Jersey cops. Yeah, See, you might Rocky's in Philadelphia. Out. Yeah, that's what that's got you. Right. I, 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 that happens to me all the time. I'm thinking they're up one there. thing. Yeah, they're way up north. You know, they're 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 up in the snow belt. They're up so. beyond beyond that Mason Dixon line, and who goes up that way anyway? <laughs> exactly. So only freaks but live two up great there. Guys, uh, Jason and Doug, uh, just absolutely hilarious. So check them out. All right, as we wrap up, and I know this went long, but we had such a good time talking with our guests. Uh, Walt, for folks who want to learn a little bit more about us, maybe they are 2002 fans who finally came and and visited us for the first time. Where can they learn more about our show? Go over to our our website. Maybe the first place to start, uh, thewilderride.com. You get everything there about us, our show, our guests, our episodes, and um, just really everything you need to know about our show. All of our social media is connected there. And speaking of social media, go over to facebook.com slash the wilder ride, follow us there, and then hit the link to join our listeners group. You'll let me ask three quick questions. Just go right through those and uh, let us know that you're a human, not a robot, and we will accept you into the group. And there's no politics, no news of the day, just entertainment and what's going on on the show. And uh, the once a week opportunity to vote for what crappy movie I've got to watch and review. So, uh, Join us there. I think I'm getting bad movie PTSD at this point, but <laughs> we got about 20 more to push through. Hey, we're so. only halfway through the year. <laughs> it's brutal. You can always look at it as you're halfway done. Yes, that's true, but I'm not going to look at it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is not a glass half empty, half full <laughs> thing. This is just survival at this point. So, uh, yeah, so check out the poll there. I'll have that up hopefully tomorrow, which will be Wednesday. I try to get it up every every Tuesday or Wednesday. So uh, take a look at that. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's brutal. So uh, so that's the best places to find us. Take a second to rate and review if you haven't done so already. And certainly use the share feature on your podcatcher of choice. If you're listening right now, go ahead and share it on your social media. It doesn't take you any effort. It doesn't cost you a dime. Just a few seconds. And that helps us spread the word and maybe grow our audience. And we appreciate everything you guys are doing to help grow the wilder ride. I uh, want you to come back next week. We've got a couple of folks who have their own podcast. Uh, there are a couple of hosts over at pod clubhouse. They had a chance to interview us once upon a time as a, as a show they thought was really cool and interesting. And they, they spotlighted us and we said, Hey, let's go ahead and do tit for tat. Let's bring you on Caroline Daly and uh, Michael Caputo. They're going to join us to chat a little bit about their podcast and about being involved with Pod Clubhouse. But the only way you're going to hear that episode is if you subscribe right now and come on back next week for another brand new edition of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. Oh, I just want to go upstairs and listen to 2002 right now for a big, big glass of scotch from what I got last night from my girls and just enjoy the thunderstorms rolling out my window. Yeah, I need to look forward to Two and a half hour episode to edit. I'm still editing the last one. I'm not surprised. It's not going to be out till Wednesday. I'm happy. Uh, Life happens. It was Father's Day. I couldn't spend all day yesterday. I know. When you hit the dance floor, you gotta be jumping.